I am so glad you convinced me that the family car should be the Defender 110. It is so beautiful inside. It's so comfortable, and it just feels indestructible. Yes, it really is. I've been waiting a long time for the new model to come out. The Defender 110, I'm telling you, it's my favorite car of all times. It's my third one. You know, I have stories of going off-road. The guy managed the group. He was like, what are you doing in this beautiful car? I'm like, I'm going off-road. He's like, are you sure? Because you can use one of ours, and then they look like Mad Max cars. I'm like, no, 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 we're going to do this. And he was shocked. Wow. Well, it's great because the Defender has been reimagined for 21st century adventure and its unparalleled off-road ability as well as its robust interior are invaluable whether you're headed towards uncharted territory or just a weekend of exploration. The Defender 110 tackles challenging surroundings with absolute confidence. The SUV conveys strength outside and in, featuring peerless technology like an intuitive driver display and an award-winning infotainment system. That's my favorite part, to keep you connected no matter where the journey takes you. Adventure is unique to everyone, and so is the Defender. Choose from the two-door Defender 90, the four-door Defender 110, or the larger Defender 130 with the ability to seat up to eight passengers. You'll find uncompromising performance in all three. So pack up and go even further with the Defender 110. Learn more at LandRoverUSA.com forward slash Defender. These days, we're all investors. Trying to be smart with our money despite our worst impulses. But at iShares, we believe that deep down inside of every investor is a better investor. One that's just waiting to be let out. Explore iShares ETFs and insights and let your best investor out. Visit iShares.com for more information. This isn't your average business podcast, and he's not your average host. This is The James Altucher Show. Today on The James Altucher Show. Oh my God, so many amazing stories. Imagine turning this into a career. You're born into a family where everyone in the family is deaf. Just try to picture how you could turn that into a huge successful career. And then imagine this, because this has happened to me. One time I broke up with a girlfriend, I called up a friend and he said, why don't you stay with me for a while? You're in shock, stay with me for a while. But imagine, so that's happened to me, but this hasn't happened to me. Imagine if the friend who says that to you is Eddie Van Halen. So we talked to Craig Gass about his amazing ability in doing impressions and how he learned it in this truly remarkable way. His experiences, you know, he, he, he's an impressionist. He does impressions on all sorts of TV shows, including every time you hear a celebrity impression on Family Guy, it's probably Craig Gass. He's a star on Howard Stern Show. You might know him from that. He, he also lived with Eddie Van Halen. And he's got some amazing stories, and particularly in the light of recent events, it it's, has a poignancy to it, and it's really so amazing to hear these stories. Really impressed with Craig. And by the way, Christopher Walken is also a guest on this upcoming podcast. So here we go. So honored to have Christopher Walken on the podcast. Not only am I a huge fan, but I heard you tell this story about this dance competition you won in China, and I just wanted to hear it again. Well, I got a lot of skills. I like to act. I like to cook, and I like to dance. And the most important part of dancing is the fight. You got to find some fight in your heart. You got to get in. Like when you fight with a chicken. You look at the chicken and you say, today is going to be your last day on earth, chicken. Say goodbye to your chicken nuggets. Because I'm about to kill you. I don't know. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> I haven't done Christopher Walken in so long. I was trying to think of like, no. what bizarre. Do you know his wife? George Ann, 
is a is a big casting director on HBO. And when I did my you're my kidding, first I used thing, to work at HBO. Uh, I wonder if I've met her. Her name is Georgianne Walken. And when I was put on Sex and the City, I I started getting offered uh, auditions for all the HBO shows for um, uh, Sopranos and and um. Oh shit! Uh, Entourage, and every time I would go in, George Ann was the woman who would read me, and I do my audition, and then afterwards she would ask me to reread the audition as her husband, and uh, <laughs> so and I remember the one I did for Sopranos was a really it was just uh, like two lines as a doctor, and I think it was something to the effect of like Tony, he's gone. There's nothing we can do about it. And she goes, all right, now do it as my husband. And I said, Tony, he's gone. There's nothing we can do about it. Pow. <laughs> she, it's like, yeah. And she what did she it. want? Did, was that just like she was then going to play it back for her husband later? Or like what was? Apparently, yeah. Yeah. That was their thing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. That's right. You were on Sex in the City. You were uh, having a relationship with Miranda, right? You were the the donut guy. Yep. And Miranda's um, uh, the overeater who overate her. <laughs> right. So you did like a a nineteen hour sex scene with her, right? Like you were That's filming right. this huge sex scene. Is I don't a I think I would feel pretty awkward doing that. And B, does anyone ever get like if you had a girlfriend or she had a boyfriend, which she did uh, at that time. Did, wouldn't you get jealous? If you, did your girlfriend get jealous Dude. that basically you were like right by Miranda's, yeah, you know, whatever for the yeah. for nineteen hours. <laughs> I w- I was sing. I think I was sing. No, no, no. I was dating a casting director at the time. I was dating a casting director, but she was a casting director. She knew the drill, and something crazy actually happened that day related to what you're asking, which is that. Um, It's my first time ever working on a TV set and I'm having to perform a sex act for 19 hours. The first from six o'clock in the morning until one o'clock the next morning. Why does it take 19 hours? (laughs) I don't, we kept taking, they were filming. We had multiple dates that all ended up in her bedroom. And so I was changing my, my, my boxers. She was changing whatever like nightwear, you know, like um, uh, lingerie she was wearing and um, and they had different angles because there's not just the back shot of the sex act. There's also the reaction because every time I came up, my face would be covered that, you know, she basically every time I got together with Miranda, uh, I love to perform on her. And every time I perform on her, she has such a huge reaction that she explodes all over my face. <laughs> and I'm, I'm such a sensitive guy that I, uh, I always am just trying to just hold her and kiss her afterwards, which freaks her out because my face is always covered in Miranda. So, um, and um, I remember um, it's my first time on a TV set and I'm performing a sex act. So I want to get to know her better. So I'm asking her, <laughs> I'm trying to like make small talk with her in between takes. And I, I remember saying, um, cause she met me at a Weight Watchers meeting and the storyline was that she had just had a baby and she's trying to get rid of her baby weight. And so I said, uh, so you have a kid in real life, right? And she goes, yeah, I do. And I go, oh, okay. And so are you married or, and she goes, no, I've been dating this guy. And I said, oh, how long have you guys been dating? And she said, like 12 years. And I said, you've been dating a guy for 12 years? And she goes, yeah. And I was like, how's that going? And she went, it's whatever. (laughs) And she got knocked up that weekend, had a kid nine months later and announced to the world, I've just had a kid and I'm leaving my man and I am a lesbian. And all my friends were like, oh my God, dude, you turned her gay. You turned her gay. You like, and I was like, dude, no, that that is my baby. If it wasn't for me, like <laughs> rubbing her all day long, she would not have gone home and said, you know what, just jam it. And she got knocked up. Yeah, right, she was able to overcome that eh about her boyfriend. 
but uh, she she saw the real deal, and uh, it was her last gasp at uh, at uh, being a heterosexual. Thanks to you. Yeah, and I'm I'm skipping over one key thing, which is that early on in that physical interaction, I was you know I I told her I don't know how you, how you feel about what we're about to do and and how do you want me to do this and she said you know what just have fun with it but just keep your mouth right here on the inside of my thigh and I said all right cool and I did exactly that but I kept I kept her close to my face so that the side of my face kept making a lot of contact and so there was a lot of friction going on and after four or five takes four or five orgasm shots I could smell it and it wasn't a bad smell it was like a it was a reactionary like happy smell it was like she was into it and it got thicker and thicker with each take and I was like oh my god this this is awesome and so yeah very graphic did she address that at all did she say good job no (laughs) she 19 uh, hours because the director and everybody was like 30, 40 feet away. And I would be sitting up in bed listening to the director and I could smell it like wafting up underneath my nose. And I was like, this is the greatest day of my life. This is awesome. Like it was a very private thing between me and her. And then she got knocked up that weekend. So, um, so yeah. See, I, I don't know if I was like her boyfriend in that situation. I'm not sure I like that, even though that's their career and you have to respect it and, and everything. Agreed. And I understand it's normal and thousands of people deal with it, but it does seem like a lot of people end up cheating on their significant others while on set with their co-stars. You know what, James, there's a, there's a comedian that you and I both know who told me a story once about a heartache he went through. He was dating, he was an older guy and he was dating this younger, really attractive girl who was an up and coming actress. And she got offered a role to play a a romantic lead in a film. And she told him, listen, I need to commit to this role. And I'm supposed to be romantic. I'm supposed to be attracted to this guy, romantically involved. So you and I need to stop dating so that I can really go full into this. And it's like, uh, like, that is one of the most awful things I've ever heard. But most actors will say it's a job and they're, you know, they're just being professional, but it is kind of an amazing hall pass to just, all right, um, you and I have to make out. This is it. This is what we got to do. You know, I mean, it's you figure the, the concept of job is a man-made term over the past 200 years, but being, you know, rubbing against someone's thighs and even <laughs> just pretending to be sexual, that's billions of years old. <laughs> Do you mind if I pee really quick? I, I literally have been on, on oh, that. Oh, my God. You got to pee? Just pee while we're doing the podcast. Don't you have a col- colostomy bag? Have you have you heard the uh, Jim Norton thing where he, uh, a couple weeks ago, he, they're doing this show on Zoom, and then uh, he had a, he would pee in a cup during the broadcast. And and then at one point, he was talking, and he went like this, and he, and he just realized he actually picked up his cup of pee. And That's funny. Yeah, uh, you know, I grew up with him from fourth grade on. And so it reminds me of what he would do in school. <laughs> Jim Norton? Yeah, yeah. We were buddies. Uh, literally, I'll, I'll tell you the, the story just real quickly. The day he moved in, he was so incredibly funny that even the teacher said, you got to be a stand-up comedian when you grow up. Like the class, I guess that was his way of, you know, dealing with being the new kid in school in the middle of the year. And we just became good friends after that, like all the way through the end. Does he know the story? Does he, did you, have you ever retold him the story about the teacher saying he should be a comedian? Yeah, yeah. Wow. And yeah, we go on each other's shows all the time. Wow, Jim, it, it, it's crazy. I'm a, I'm a really positive, glasses half full person, and I am naturally repelled by people who are negative, but nobody spews more beauty in negativity than Jim Norton. I cannot believe how colorful he is. That's such an interesting observation because like you compare him to, let's say, Doug Stanhope and it's a different style when you could be kind of cynical but also positive like Jim is, but Doug isn't. And I appreciate yeah. Doug's comedy too, but but Jim, you, you go along for the ride with him. Yeah, Jim's 
anger and hatred is so unbelievably detailed in hostility. It, it's there's so much thought put into what he wants to happen to the people he doesn't like that it is comical. The hatred that he, that he, can, you, you, I'll tell you, I'll tell you what it is. He's he's humble, at one hundred percent, and it's interesting because I've I've it blows me away the sincerity that he shows when people stop him to say I love you and he says thank you thank you very much thank you yeah and, and he's and he's and he means it and um I've always been um blown away by that. And he, he actually helped me. Uh, he had a conversation with me that was the, the, the jumping off point where he gave me a moment of clarity that helped me stop doing drugs and to go into recovery. I've been clean now for uh, over 15 years. It'll be 16 in December, but it was a conversation with him that broke through to me and it was a incredibly uh, selfless and uh, humble conversation that we had that gave me the humility I needed to stop beating myself up and just start going into recovery. What did, what did Jim say? That's, that's amazing. Um, I had relapsed, even though I had had a heart attack um, oh doing uh, Coke, I, I had a heart attack at the age of 32 and um, I related all this stuff to him about how much worse I was getting in my addiction. And, um, the main part of the conversation that, that I didn't expect to hear, and it sounds very simple, but through all this discussion of all these bad choices I was making, Jim said, you can let that all go. And today can be your first day. It's okay. You can, you can, you can accept those things that you've done and let today be your first day and you can start over right now. It's, it's completely up to you. Right. I know that you made some bad decisions, but today can be the first day. And I don't know why, but that was the thing that spoke to me. And sometimes, you know, for everybody, it's different. There was this amazing book that came out written by a Kennedy called Moments of Clarity. And it's 30 or 40 personalities, uh, comedians, actors, musicians, uh, 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 news people, all describing their moment of clarity when they knew they needed to stop drinking or doing drugs. And there's one in there by Tom Arnold that's really uh, beautiful and, and gut-wrenching where he says that um, he was living with Roseanne and his drug addiction had really spiraled to where he would leave and just disappear for days at a time. And he said that he was, there was a room in the house that had mirrors on one wall. And he was convinced in his psychosis that there was a camera crew behind the mirrors that were documenting his addiction for a reality show. And he would spend hours talking to the mirrors and explaining where his mind was at, at that moment. Cause he was convinced that there were people recording it and he would talk for hours to these mirrors. And, um, he said that one night, uh, he tried to sneak back in the house after leaving for several days, Roseanne was calling. He wasn't answering the calls. He wasn't answering the texts. And then he, uh, he came back home at 3 a.m. at a time that he thought was safe to sneak back in. The code to get into the gate was his birthday, and he couldn't remember his birthday. Oh, my gosh. So he called Roseanne and said, uh, hey, I'm outside the gate. I can't get in. And he waited. The door opened up. Roseanne came walking up the driveway, and him, he braced himself for she's going to lay into me. But she opened up the gate. And she hugged him and said, I love you. I, I just want you to be safe. I love you, please. And he said that was his moment of clarity. It was unconditional love that made him realize I need to, I need to stop. And, uh, uh, but yeah, that moment with Jim, um, 
it, it's it's weird, but those words hit me at that moment in a way that I that I needed, and I realized I that I was repeating this cycle of like, oh my god, I can't believe I did this. I can't like I was. I was sober after a heart attack and now I'm going backwards and backwards and backwards. And, and it was this simple thing that I just realized, okay, yeah, you're right. I can stop right now. And, and on the two year anniversary of my heart attack, I just light bulbs on and I stopped and I haven't had a drink or done any drugs since. So wow. have you told Jim the story? Yeah. When I, at the last Super Bowl in Phoenix, Jim was at the Improv in Tempe, and I was hanging out with him afterwards. He brought me into his into his dressing room, and Kenny was there. I just saw Kenny a, uh, a week or two ago with Bill Burr, and and uh, and Kenny said, "Remember that night when you said that thing to Jim?" And I told him, uh, "I don't know if you remember this conversation, but I've been sober ever since." And at that time, I had just hit the ten year mark, and I just said, uh, "I really need to thank you," but. It's weird. I feel that Jim isn't good with uh, pats on the back. So, because uh, he just said, oh, that, that's great. He just, he just, you know, moved on to something else, you know? I, th- I think he's a very humble guy. You know, he's, probably... he, he absolutely is. And the most fascinating side of Jim Norton I've ever seen is when he used to do a, an advice show on Sirius XM. And the amount of thoughtfulness that went into his answers for all the different types of struggles that people were going through, they asked Jim for answers about was really breathtaking. Um, he really, he really is a thoughtful person. And, and did you ever hear that his advice show? No, I didn't. I'm going to go listen to that. It's got, it, there has to be episodes of it online. And, uh, I always remember, and this is just really good advice in terms of drug addiction and how to deal with a loved one if, if there's someone in your life that's struggling. Somebody called in once and said, uh, and by the way, what I'm about to say is not a thoughtful or, or anything I just described. It's just a funny line. He said that um, a guy called in and said, my wife has just recently relapsed. She doesn't know that I know, but I found a couple of empty bottles of vodka underneath the toilet in the bathroom and i don't know what how to approach her about it and jim said well you can tell her hey listen i love you and uh i just want you to know i i found those those bottles that were in the in the bathroom is there any way that i can help you at all um what i would not do is I would not kick the door open and say, listen, buster. And I don't know why, but the word buster made me laugh so hard. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and he was right on. He was right on. Like, you don't want to, like, I used to live with Mitch Hedberg. Uh, he was my first uh, roommate in New York. And um, I started hearing these crazy stories after I moved out that he was getting into heroin. And I was thinking, He's not on heroin. Like he's he's a pot smoking guy who likes to. He doesn't do it. like I've done coke with him a couple times, but he doesn't. Not a heroin guy. And the stories that I started to hear were really dark. And and I would occasionally check in with Mitch and say, "Hey, are you are you doing okay?" And he'd go, "Yeah, man, I'm doing good. How are you doing?" <laughs> and and I'd go, "Uh, doing all right. Are you? Are you?" Sh- you- sure you're okay there's you and and he would say no i'm fine he kept changing the subject and i realized from uh my own experiences from my own addictions and then addictions of people who were close to me that you cannot push somebody you can't you know ultimately it's up to that person to make that decision which is heartbreaking if you love somebody it's heartbreaking when you care about somebody and they're spiraling but if you try to get involved, you'll just end up spiraling with them and they'll, they'll take you down if they don't want to get help themselves. So it was, it was really tough to, to not, to, to actually, even though I was early in recovery, it was tough to, as a guy who knows a lot about addiction, it was tough to, to find myself struggling 
with the right words to say because I didn't want to push him away. I was, I was, it, it was very tenuous, and I didn't want to. And that um, the first year that I got clean, Mitch was one of seven friends who died in the first year that I got clean. All seven comedians, by the way, four drug overdoses and three drinking and driving car accidents, all comedians in the first year that I got clean. And sadly, every one of those deaths were a reminder that I had to keep going. What do you think, what do you think is the relationship between comedy and that, that hole inside of you that, that addiction fills? Um, I don't know. It's, you know, creative people of all types find themselves uh, in that same space. I don't know. There's something about uh, pushing for um, that desire to feel good, uh, that desire to be loved or feel loved. And, and if you find the right drug, which for me was cocaine, if you find the right drug, you can feel that sense of some kind of uh, satisfaction or being able to fill that, that hole, that, that void in well, your life. L- l- let me ask you this, and I, I know you have to go to the bathroom, but uh, do you feel like performers in general, so not just artists, but performers, so comedy, musicians, whatever, they're good at one to many, like broadcasting their talent, their message, Mm -hmm. their, their love for their art form and so on. But it's a little harder in like group settings, like a party or a dinner or, you know, where they have to interact with a lot of people and really, really interact as opposed to just perform their whole heart and soul. And I wonder if it's the difficulty of that, you know, group dynamic that says, oh, well, if I take cocaine, I'll be a little more social. I'll be able to deal with this. If I take heroin, I'll be able to deal with my own remorse at not being able to be social in these group settings. I always wonder about this because for me, I have no problem getting on a stage and broadcasting. But when it comes to social situations involving more than one person, it's incredibly difficult. Yeah, I've always felt like I'm not a real comedian because I love socializing. I love talking to people. Every elevator ride that I take, I have a 20 second. So how are you doing today? Like I, I love talking to strangers. Um, and, uh, but I've noticed that a lot of my comedian friends are uh, uncomfortable in social situations. And I think that You know, a lot of people who uh, struggle with alcoholism do commonly say that their awkwardness in social situations was was handled by drinking. And they realize, oh, if I have some drinks, I feel fine. And then it's just this, you don't know that there's a line that you're crossing over where it's it's getting, it's, it's doing more damage than good. This is such a valuable service for all business owners, big businesses, small businesses, doesn't matter. I wish I had this in the many different businesses that I've started. Sometimes it seems like your business is humming, but then suddenly you don't understand it. You're starting to fall behind. You're not understanding what where your costs are, where your revenues are, where where your payments are. Teams are buried in all sorts of like BS work and you can't seem to close the books. So you need like one dashboard, one source of truth. I'm jealous of this business, NetSuite from Oracle, of course, NetSuite by Oracle. I wish I'd come up with this idea. It's it's a brilliant concept to have all your business intelligence on one dashboard. This is why you need to know these three numbers, 37,000, 25, and one. So 37,000, that's the number of businesses which have upgraded to NetSuite by Oracle. NetSuite is the number one cloud financial system, streamlining accounting, financial management, inventory, HR, and more. 25, NetSuite turns 25 this year. That's 25 years of helping businesses do more with less, close their books in days, not weeks, and drive down costs. One 
because your business is one of a kind. So you get a customized solution for all of your key performance indicators, your KPIs, in one efficient system with one source of truth. Manage risk, get reliable forecasts, and improve margins. Everything you need to grow all in one place. So right now, download NetSuite's popular KPI checklist designed to give you consistently excellent performance absolutely free at netsuite.com slash james. That's netsuite.com slash james to get your own KPI checklist. netsuite.com slash james. I have to say, I love your intellectual approach on any topic, which is why I really love the article that you wrote that got you so much attention. And then I know you're probably tired of, of talking about it, but uh, the fact that Jerry Seinfeld, of all people, wanted to respond. I know. I, I mean, I disagreed with the take that you had, but I appreciated the take because it was like, uh, here's everything that backs up what I'm saying. And this is what I feel. And, and this is what's going to happen. And then when Jerry Seinfeld, I was like, Holy shit! Now Jerry's doing press about it. Now they're, now you're getting tons of attention about it. And then you have this, and this is the part I don't get. You're getting hostility from people because you had this opinion. Yeah, and I even say in the article, I want to be wrong. Convince me I'm wrong, and instead yeah. everyone just convinces me I'm an asshole. <laughs> yeah, like <laughs> they don't talk about New York City. They're just like you're, you're a mentally ill. Like something's wrong with you. And, or as Jerry Seinfeld put it in his classy 1930s terminology, you're a putz, yeah. but it is what it is. Like, <laughs> but yeah, and, and it's funny because uh, I don't know what your feeling was about, uh, uh, about these internet online internet mobs that, that happened before this took place. But now you're getting this, uh, people want to silence you. There's this bizarre yeah. thing of like, shut up, shut your mouth, you know? And yeah, it's- which I've gotten before, but never to the extent where like, it was basically 10 tweets a second for three weeks, <laughs> like all really? day and night. Yeah. Wow. It was insane. Cause it was probably like a couple of million people hated me. Now millions were like, okay, this makes sense you know, or I disagree, but he makes some points. I need to think about this. So those are normal people who just read it and then go on with their lives. But then there's like a good five to 10% that are just batshit crazy. Yeah. And they, they have to kill you before they can go on with their life. <laughs> and, and did it go through waves? Like, do you see like a, a, have you seen it go back and forth where you felt waves or people were on your side and then waves of them being against you and then back again? Yeah, absolutely. And and particularly, it was funny because Seinfeld was 10 days later and I had thought that it was just ending, which was I was grateful for. I really just wanted to point out the problems and then I wanted to move on with my life. I don't usually write about these things. And then, but with the Seinfeld thing, then there became sort of these weird waves where it was intersecting with waves of whether people liked Seinfeld or not. So people would say, I don't really, don't worry. I never even really liked Seinfeld's comedy anyway. And I'm like, it has nothing to do with it. I actually love, I'm reading his book right now. It's amazing. Like I love his comedy. And so don't mix issues. Like it's, this is the issues I mentioned. That's the only thing. And it, it just got insane. It was also interesting that a lot of people suddenly started taking the side of, uh, oh yeah, that's uh uh, who's got a better perspective than the guy who can afford to go through this pandemic, who is a multi, multi-millionaire. And sure, he's going to be fine. And New York is going to be fine, according to this guy who has tons of money. And, you know, it, it's, New York is not an easy place to live financially to begin with, you know, and, and add this situation. And although I, I understand this situation is actually uh, having an effect on uh, uh prices dropping now um yeah and also tax revenues uh mm -hmm. for next year they're gonna have problems but what was weird was then uh mayor de blasio held a press conference where he, he basically talks about my article and then he says but thank god for jerry uh the best comedian in the world calling out this putz yeah. and then Later that day, Andrew Cuomo even sent out an email referring to both articles like, thank you, Jerry Seinfeld. And I actually felt good about that because 
As far as I know, that's the only time Cuomo and de Blasio agreed on anything. And I thought maybe there will actually be good, positive changes in New York City. Wow. But it did not lead to that, unfortunately. That (laughs) is crazy. Well, congrats on all the attention. And uh, uh, I think it's kind of neat because, you know, people do move on to the next thing they get upset about. And uh, I think it's uh, it might not be fun in the moment, but I think it's interesting to look back on. uh, and, uh, you know, cause I, I think that you're going to end up being able to be someone that your friends are going to be able to lean on when they end up in a situation where they get a ton of attention and you can share your experience, you know, cause it's for all of us. No, I, I think that's true. And I, and it's allowed me to be very analytical about this because I'm able to say, well, what happened here? That's different than other articles that get different responses. And that's been interesting data to mine from, but Craig, I wanna I wanna get back to your amazing career and and basically I know your story, but I'd love to hear it from you. And by the way, I've been a fan. I've seen you perform live many times, and a huge fan. You're, what you do is is amazing, and we'll we'll get to that. But you have like this this not many people in life have like an origin story. Like you have like a superhero. It's like you're, you're it's like you're an X Man. You have this like superhero ar- origin story that is out of a comic book almost. And I don't know if you've ever thought of it that way because it's so in, in, in intense and weird, but maybe describe it. And I, I apologize if I called it weird and that's an insult, but it really not is Not at weird. all, not at all. And I, I think it's, it's always been told to me, people would say that they would ask me like, wow, isn't that weird how you grew up? And, it, and I always say, no, how you grow up is just how you grow up. You don't- Right, you don't know anything else. It. But I mean, if I had led a more normal life and then those circumstances happened, then it would be like, oh, this is weird. But the way you grow up is the way you grow up. So I'm mostly known as a voice guy. I can do um, any voice that I hear. And it's because of how I grew up, um, which, and this is not a joke. This is a true story. Everybody in my family is deaf. My mom, my dad, and my sister are all completely deaf. So growing up in a deaf family, I couldn't learn how to talk for my family. I learned how to talk by copying all the voices I heard on TV. Is that what would happen? Like you would be watching TV. Mm -hmm. You obviously know sign language. Everybody Mm -hmm. in your house would just be talking with their fingers. Mm -hmm. And you're like imitating, I don't know, at that time, like who was on TV then? (laughs) Uh, Really memorable voices at the time were Muhammad Ali, Howard Cosell, the Fonz, I would talk like all of them. Uh, I was a really weird kid. And, and I know that we can all sound like anybody we want to because of my experience. Like we all learn our rhythms and our dialect and our funny sounding accents by trying to blend in to our environments so that we, that we fit into our world, which is why deaf people sound the way they do, because they can't hear anybody to adjust their voice to sound like anybody else around them. They just open their mouth and, and they just push sound out, but they can't hear how that matches up to anybody else. And the, the level of subtleties that we pick up from the people around us is evident in, I always point out, if you've ever called up your best friend uh, and somebody picks up the phone and you think it's your best friend and it could be somebody of the opposite sex in the same family, but they've all learned how to pick up the phone and go mellow and do that little, that little nuance they've picked up in their family. So um, we all adjust and then we stop. And uh, I didn't have anybody in my family showing me how to talk. So I was watching TV and copying all the voices I heard on TV and then over time, that just became like a party trick. In high school, I, I would be at parties, and the most common way this would happen is uh, people would say, hey, if we gave you some Coke, uh, will you <laughs> do some impressions for us? And I'd go, fuck yeah. And I got really good at impressions. <laughs> but I also developed a really bad Coke habit that I had to work my way through. So. Oh my God. So at, at high school reunions, do they still say, Hey man, here's some Coke. Can you do Al Pacino? 
Yeah, you know what's funny is they'll at high school reunions they say the impressions that I was doing back then, which was Cliff Clavin from Cheers. <laughs> they go, hey, oh, like, hey man, you want to do some Cliff Clavin? And they go, like, eh, you know that uh, eh, the uh, Aborigines uh, first discovered uh, cocaine in the early 1400s. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, you know. And uh, uh, so yeah, it was whatever impressions that I was doing at the time. And what's crazy is. I become a rock fan. I love music. And I, I look up to all these big rock stars who are super confident. And, and, um, and I watch them so much that their voices get like burned into my brain. And uh, it's usually uh, someone who I hear a lot of, I can do their voice. And, and whenever I tell a story about people, I usually do the voice of the person and I don't consciously do it. And then sometimes I, I don't even realize I can do an impression. Like we were talking about Tom Arnold earlier. And I remember telling somebody, hey, did you watch uh, The Tonight Show last night with Tom Arnold? He looked crazy. He was really frenetic. And he was up in Leno's face going, hey, you know what? It's, it's funny. Uh, I like big women and cocaine. And, uh, you know, and my friend would look at me and go, oh, my God, I didn't know you could do that impression. I said, I didn't know I could do that either. That was crazy. And, um, but, but, yeah, it's, it's, I don't usually – it can come really easily. Um, sometimes I got to work on it, but, um, but Howard Stern started putting me on to do uh, voices on his show. And I started doing celebrity voices. I started out with Sam Kinison. Um, every time a, a, a bad person died, I would be on the air the next day as Sam Kinison calling live from the gates of hell with uh with that dead person and it was somebody we could all agree was a bad person like when jeffrey dahmer passed away the next day i was on the air as sam kinnison going hey guys it's it's sam kinnison and i'm down here in hell and uh i'm sitting here with jeffrey dahmer who's looking at my ass like it's a t-bone oh oh <laughs> so yeah it, it became this really dark piece that i would do and then i started doing um random uh i would take an impression and try to make it like i would bastardize it like al pacino had twins in his late 60s or early 70s he had twins and i said wouldn't it be funny if we could have one of the babies on the howard stern show as a regular guest and howard would do these interviews where he'd go I don't know if you've heard, Al Pacino has just had twins, and we're being joined now by Al Pacino's baby. Uh, Al Pacino's baby, what do you like to do for fun? Uh, what do I like to do for fun? I like to pee. <laughs> I like to pee. I love to pee. My mother, uh, Beverly D'Angelo, when she changes my diapers, I give her a quick squirt right in the face. Ooh, uh, <laughs> And she likes it because she's a whore. Yeah, the whole thing <laughs> is like really just terrible. And um, most recently doing a lot of voiceover work where uh, shows like Family Guy or American Dad and most recently Disney will start sending me voice match stuff where they'll say, can you do this voice? And if you give me a few days, I can nail it. The weirder the voice, the easier it is for me to do it. Which, uh, when I met Eddie Van Halen and ended up in his house, that was everything he knew about me was was that. So, and so, so I want to get to that in, in in one second. But are the voices that are easy, you mentioned this earlier that you know some voices are very distinctive, so that you can do these impressions like Al Pacino, Christopher Walken, and and, and so on. Do you think about mecha the mechanics of it, like? Oh, I've got to have my tongue touch my palate over here. Or is it just like you become the persona and then it, you feel it and then you, you do it? Well, I always think of the person more than the voice. Uh, the voice kind of comes out when I think of the person. Like, like Tom Arnold is, is very, uh, he's very uh, uh, intense and uh, he's, uh, you know, kind of sweaty, you know, and, uh, uh, you know, and then there's uh, Adam Sandler is uh, very uh, uh, nervous. <laughs> <laughs> and he's, uh, he's, uh, he's, he's a Jew, like me. <laughs> and uh, so, um, 
I think of the person and then the voice kind of comes out. But when I start messing around with the voice and trying to find it, I, I, it's like, I, I don't, I'm looking for, I always, it, it's like tuning a guitar. I'll hit one note and it's like, oh, that's it right there. Like I remember with Christopher Walken, it was oh, little man. I don't know why, but that, that was the one note I hit. Little man, little man. And I just kept repeating that sound over and over because I was hitting that note like that, like that note. And then I had to figure out how to just play other notes in the same oh, until, un, until if you try to carry a conversation, there's a lot of ups and downs. And sometimes it's a bottom out. And you try to find all the tones and you try to put, pull all the notes together to where it all kind of, you hit all those notes and then, and then you got it. And then you can say anything you want in that voice. I remember with Sam Kinison, uh, it was like, uh, it was the laugh that, uh, <laughs> and then it was the, it was it, it was that slurred speech. I, I kind of was, um, there was some sound that I got with Sam first and it just kept building. That's why every voice, I just try to hit a note and I just keep repeating the note over and over again until I can add a couple more notes and, and I have my jumping off point from that one perfect sound. And then I try to get all the other sounds around it and then all the other sounds and all the other sounds until I have the whole. That's fascinating. So you listen to, let's say, a lot of recordings or videos and, and it takes a few days. Do you think it's possible... Like, I'm 52, never did impressions. You think it's possible for someone like me to learn impressions of very distinctive voices like a Christopher Walken or something like Absolutely. that? Absolutely. And, and again, it's be, the reason you sound the way that you do is because of the environment you grew up in. And by the way, there are some impressions I've gotten down by hanging out with the children of that person hmm. because they all pick up nuances. You sound like people in your family. And your family has those same kind of rhythms that you're doing right now. You have consciously or subconsciously picked up from your family. So um, sometimes if you listen to somebody who is either the parent or the child of the person you're trying to do the impression of, you can nail it because they all exhibit those little nuances. It's interesting. I wonder though, like you're so used to identifying the nuances from childhood I wonder if that's a muscle memory that if you try to develop when you're older, you wouldn't necessarily have. Yeah, like um, th that's possible. My mom told me that I learned the alphabet in sign language in an hour when I was three years old. But infants can learn sign language before they start speaking. That's pretty well documented that you can teach wow. a baby uh, milk, or food or water, um, you can teach them um, sign language. And, and a baby can communicate with sign language before they start speaking. And it's well known also that when you're young, you, you absorb and, and uh, process uh, new things much quicker. You, you can pick up things much quicker. And as you get older, you, you're not as strong. But yeah, I think we all can absolutely learn to bend our voices to sound like uh, somebody else. And it's just a matter of just being around them long enough that you absorb it. You can just hear it in your head. And that for me, I'm, when I walk out of a movie that features somebody who talks really uniquely, I'll talk like that person in the movie for the rest of the day. Cause that voice is stuck in my head. That, that, that's so funny. And you know, and, and this is why I'm going to have to insist at some point we do a part two, because I want to get to the, um, your stories of living with Eddie Van Halen and, and yep. it's, it's such a tragedy that he passed away so, so young and so recently. But, you know, I just want to point out one more thing about the voices is that I was just listening to a bunch of Louis C.K. specials in a row. And obviously he's, he's, his jokes are, his joke construction is funny. He always has insightful things to say. Um, but I noticed just really, I was really being analytical the highest laughs and the most laughs per minute were always when in the, in the middle of a joke, he did a voice. He wasn't necessarily doing mm. impressions, but he would do like God's voice arguing with Abraham, or he would oh. do a voice of a, a woman talking about abortion or whatever. Mm. And that's when the audience would just 
they couldn't keep the tension in anymore. They would start laughing. And it seems like a critical part of comedy to do voices, do act outs, not just tell the joke. The the best, like Dave Chappelle with his cop voice, his white voice. Yeah. You know, people laugh hysterically no matter what. Yeah. And so, so it must, you, A, you must uh, do very well. In the, I, I know it because I've seen it. You do very well in the stand-up when the voices are kicking in. I mean, you do well before then, but the voices are key. And it's interesting that people respond so viscerally to that with, with all the comedians. Yeah, the only thing I have to be careful of is, is when it comes to stand-up, I have to, I, I have to limit how much I watch a favorite comedian because I'll hear their sounds start to bleed in. Uh, uh, and, uh, you know, when I first started, I had this relationship with George Carlin when I first started that, that George was a mentor. He flew me to LA, uh, to, wow. to do some sets early on in my, um, in my career. And, and I was such a George Carlin fan and, and loved him so much as a, as a human being that, uh, I would notice that I was, uh, doing his voice and, and, and physically being a little bit like George on stage. And I would end my thoughts with a dramatic sound that sounded like George. Um, when I would watch a lot of Kinnison, I found myself kind of, you know, doing this. Um, and lately, I've been, I saw Bill Burr uh, two weeks ago, and, and, and we hung out a little bit, and, and I find myself, like, laughing, going, <laughs> like and i'm like oh man i'm doing a doing a bill burr laugh like i gotta stop doing that so I, I have to like other comics will talk about needing to stop watching a comic because uh their joke structure influence will appear in their material and for me it's a sound their sounds will start showing up in my set and i have to i have to stop watching them so their sounds don't show up it, it, it's so funny i i could relate because for me, if I'm watching a comedian over and over again right before I'm going on stage, yeah. I won't do their voice, but I'll do their pacing. Yes. And, and I'll do their facial expressions. 100%. Yeah. And, and I've and, heard a lot of comics talk about that. Yeah. And, and, and I don't necessarily think that's a bad thing because most people can't tell. <laughs> like yeah. if you're just doing like an all, like if you just raise an eyebrow and scrunch your face up and that's like a Louis C.K. being, you know, acting out a confused person or or whatever they all have their own particular pacing but it's it's an interesting thing but i do want to um i want to and and i didn't know that about carlin we'll have to talk about that at, at some other point i'll we'll, i have my own george carlin story but eddie van halen did he want you around because you were the funny guy like what happened <laughs> It all started with a concert in 2002 in Los Angeles uh, at the Universal Amphitheater. I was backstage at this show. I have a lot of friends in the music business. I've brought a lot of uh, musicians to stand up New York. I brought the Chili Peppers there, David Lee Roth and, and his solo band. The guys in Corn and Lincoln Park came to see me. Um, yeah, so I would always, um, I've had a lot of friends in the music industry. That was my first love was music, and I wanted to be in the music business. And I ended up, um, making a lot of friends in music. So I'm backstage at this show. Now I'm a stand-up comedian and I'm part of the Howard Stern show. And this guy who's a big supporter of my comedy career says, let me introduce you to everybody. And he starts introducing me to like, you know, big rock stars and, and all these people where I'm such a savant about music. I, I would read liner notes on every album that some of the names I'd go, I know you, you're the guy who did the, did the thing on the blah, blah, blah album and this album, and they would go, yeah, okay, dude. <laughs> like, yeah. Like, and, um, and at one point this guy goes, uh, oh my God. Okay. Uh, listen, I'm going to, I'm going to introduce you to this guy. This guy lives with one of the biggest rock stars on the planet, but don't tell him I told you that. So, come on. And we walk over and he goes, uh, <clears throat> Hey Maddie. Hey man. Uh, I don't know if you're a fan of the Howard Stern show or if you, uh, you know, watch this TV show or this, show, but this is a comedian friend of mine. His name's Craig Gass. And this guy turns around and goes, dude, I am your biggest fan. And I said, <laughs> get out of here. No way. And we started talking. We exchanged phone numbers and I don't know anybody else in LA. So I call him up and ask him if he wanted to go bowling. And, uh, on the night that we're going to go bowling, 
I made some calls over to the alley to make sure they were open. They had a, a league night that was going on until nine o'clock. So anytime after nine was fine. So I related the information back to him and said, Hey, can we do uh, is nine o'clock good? Can you meet me at the bowling alley at nine? And he said, Yeah, absolutely. Hey, quick question. Is it okay if I bring my friend Ed with me? I've been telling him about you and he's a big fan of yours and and he's been hearing about you, you know, since you first came on the Howard Stern show. And huh. and I want to know, uh, you know, he's when he heard that you were in town, he said he wanted to meet you. And I said, Yeah, that's fine. And he goes, All right, because he's got a kid. His kid's twelve. So and I was like, dude, it's bowling. Whatever. And he showed up at the bowling alley with Eddie Van Halen. Oh. And I had to start piecing it together and figure out, and I realized, okay, so this guy is Eddie Van Halen's assistant, and he lives on the property in a guest house. And it's like he, the Cato Kalen of Eddie Van Halen. Well, I became the Cato Kalen later. <laughs> he actually has a job helping out Eddie, and he he runs the Fifty One Fifty Studios, and he is such a Howard Stern fan that he gets up every morning at 5 a.m. to go up into the studio, turn on the radio, and work while he listens to Howard Stern for five hours. Mm-hmm. And um, so uh, when I started appearing on the Howard Stern show, it started to become like, oh, my God, Ed, there's a guy on the Howard Stern show. He does this crazy Sam Kinison impression. Uh, and then it was a week later, oh, my God, the same guy does an amazing Gene Simmons impression. Oh, my God, the same guy does a Morgan Freeman impression. Oh, my God, the same guy does a Paul Stanley. Same oh, my guy God, does- wait a second. You got to do a Morgan Freeman impression. Well, I suppose at some point I will be finishing this story. But right now, we're going to take a break. <laughs> that is the, that's an incredibly hard impression by the way he's like he's got like velvet on his voice i don't yeah, know how does. anyone does it that's that was great there's two levels there's the uh shawshank redemption the man who has a way with words and makes you feel like you're taking a ride and then there's the the teacher um in that bad school with all the crazy out of control kids all right hey pull your pants up and get back to class like that guy, you know, but anyways, I got to work on that. But, um, it's been a while since I did Morgan. So, uh, so I'm at the bowling alley, Eddie Van Halen is now telling me my life story back to me. And one of the things he tells me is a story that he heard me tell on the air where I had related that I've been broke my whole life before I started doing stand up comedy. And once I started making money, all I've ever wanted to own was an illegal cable box. That's all I've ever wanted is to have one of those. They were like $300 at the time. And you hook them up to your cable and it unscrambles all your channels. Eddie is telling me in the bowling alley, he's smoking a cigarette. You're not supposed to be smoking in the bowling alley. And he's smoking a cigarette. He goes, dude, I heard you were broke your whole life. He goes, that's crazy. Me too. And I heard that, uh, is this true? that uh, all you ever wanted was an illegal cable box? And I said, yeah, that is 100% true. And he goes, that's crazy. Cause, uh, and he looked both ways and he went, I got an illegal cable box too. And I was like, what? Are you serious? And he goes, yeah. And he goes, the thing is, I'm fucking rich, but uh, don't want to pay for cable. And I was like, are you serious? What the fuck? Like, and we ended up having this uh, fun night of bowling. And then over the course of the next year and a half, I would um, hang out with Maddie at the 5150 studios, uh, which was on Ed's property. And then occasionally Ed would roll in we'd all shoot the shit. And then I got in a, in a really toxic relationship with a girl that ended one night when we were at a party at this event called the NAM show uh, in Anaheim. And, um, uh, uh, I left to go to the bathroom for a couple minutes. When I came back, she was making out with a guy in the bar. Oh, and, uh, and I was really uh, heartbroken. Um, I, um, I picked up the phone. I called Maddie. And I said, hey, man, um, you're not going to believe what I, just, what I just went through tonight. And I'm telling him. And he goes, hold, hold on, hold on. Hold on. Ed wants to talk to you. And Ed got on the phone and said, dude, 
I told you she was a whore. And I go, yeah, well, you know, and he said, hey, you're living with her. What the fuck are you living with her for? And I said, she's the only person I know besides you guys. That's why I'm living with her. And he said, dude, back up your shit and move in with me. And I said, really? Is that okay? Can I, can I stay with you? And he said, yeah. He goes, you can move in the recording studio. Stay as long as you want, but don't tell anybody. But uh, the band's getting back together. So it's going to be noisy at night. And I was like, so the only thing I have to worry about is the fact that Van Halen is going to be playing in the next room. And he said, well, I know you're working on your TV show. Because I was working on a brand new show at the time for NBC called uh, Las Vegas with right. James Kahn and, and Alec Baldwin. And uh, so over the course of the next um, four months, I am, well, the first like couple weeks, I'm working on a TV show where I'm hanging out on a, on a set telling jokes to James Kahn and Alec Baldwin. And then every night I'd come home and Eddie would be in the next room and I'd knock on the door and say, hey, man, I just got home. I'm um, getting ready to go to bed. Do you mind if I listen for a little bit? And every night he'd go, dude, I'm fucking lonely. Come on in. And I'd walk in and, and listen to him play and we'd shoot the shit. And um, uh, it was surreal. Like, so the next couple months I'm living my life inside of a super famous guy's world. And um, uh, every once in a while they, they'd intersect like, I, I took Maddie to a Metallica concert one night at the Forum, and I met a girl at, at the show who I really hit it off with. We were texting each other throughout the whole show, and then, and then when I uh, got back to the house, she texted me around midnight and said, hey, I just dropped off my friends. Do you want to hang out? And I was like, yeah. I called her up, and, and she goes, where are you at? And I said, I'm in the Hollywood Hills. She goes, all right. Do you want me to come over? And I was like, yeah. I, ooh, I don't. I don't know. Uh, let, me, let me call you back. I don't know if that's okay or not. And she goes, oh, you have a girlfriend. I said, no, no, I do not have a girl. I'm just, I live in a really unique situation. So let, let, me, let me just find out. And uh, uh, I found Ed and I said, hey, Ed, uh, I don't know if Maddie told you, but I met a girl tonight and she wants to come over. Is it okay if, if I keep her up at the studio? And he said, dude, get some pussy. And I was like, all right, cool, cool, cool. So I called her up and I said, all right, meet me at the bottom of Coldwater Canyon. There's a, there's a Ralph's uh, supermarket right there. So I had her meet me at the Ralph's and I, and I said, just leave your car at the Ralph's. I'll bring you up the hill. And I bring her up and I take her through the back. There's two entrances to get onto the property and the back entrance is right next to the studios. So I take her through the back entrance and the whole way up there, she's peppering me with questions like, why do you need permission to have someone visit you? And I said, I'm in, it's just a really, I'm living in a unique situation. I just, and I don't know how to tell her I live at Eddie Van Halen's house. So I still haven't said anything to her. Uh, we park, I open the door of the studio. She walks in first and she looks around the room and goes, Wow is your friend like the biggest Van Halen fan on the planet or what? And I was like, um, uh, and then she starts discovering stuff that just, she can't understand. She's like, how do you get something like this? And I said, um, do you, you hear the noise in the other room? That's Van Halen. Oh my God. Th this is, by the uh, way, that has to make you the coolest guy in the world for this girl. Yeah. And, and I said, you know, this is Eddie Van Halen's house and I'm, and I'm, he's letting me stay here until I get back on my feet. And to answer the next question that every guy always asked, the answer is two minutes. It took two minutes from that point. So, um, <laughs> and, um, yeah, that, that was pretty, surreal but yeah over the next I, I, I love i love how eddie van halen had to warn you about the noise <laughs> yes like, oh my god like he's thinking and he said oh my gosh I, i'm a little bit loud when i the, play this little yeah. instrument i play it comes down <laughs> to the disturb most, him 
it, the most simple of human experiences. It's going to be loud at night. You can stay there. You can crash on the couch. There's a whole living room there, but it's going to be loud. So it will be disruptive, but the noise will be coming from Van Halen in the next room. Like, yeah, it was, it was very surreal. At some point I remember um, coming back from work and uh, throwing the door open and there was a guy sleeping on the couch and I was like, Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, I'm Craig. I'm, I'm, I'm staying here for a little bit. And, uh, and he said, Oh, Hey, I'm Al. And I said, Hey, Al. And then I went, Oh my God, that's, that's, that's Alex Van Halen. Holy shit. And then Alex started showing up. And when Alex started showing up, uh, uh, it just became like storytelling time. Like he would, we would hang out and just tell, I love a good story. I love hearing a good story. I love telling a good story. And Alex Van Halen had amazing stories. And, and uh, because this is like a long form thing, I just want to tell you, one of my favorites that he told me was that. Oh, wait, wait, Craig. Uh, and this is the point where, unfortunately, I have to do an audiobook with Amazon in three minutes. Oh, okay, I'm, no problem. I'm dying because I want to hear this. All right, teaser. Are we, are we okay? Can we schedule a part two? Like, we have to do, I haven't even begun my question, so we have to get to a part two. Absolutely. Is it possible we can do this later today? Yeah. Okay, Okay, perfect. and then last minute request. Can you do a Seinfeld impression? Because <laughs> I'm going to do it my next time. You know, I never did a Seinfeld because so many comics did a Seinfeld, but I don't think it's that hard because his uh, his rhythm is this. Like, uh, he's got the, uh, what are you doing? I don't know. I don't know. Ah, ah. Like, those are the sounds that I hear in my head, but I never tried to do it because so many comics did it. Yeah. I always tried to just hold on to things that nobody else was doing, which is why I'm embarrassed that I do a Christopher Walken impression because so many people do a Christopher Walken. So, um, but, but the Mo Morgan Freeman, that's Im impossible to do. And you pulled it off perfectly, but three o'clock part two, I'm looking forward to it. I'll, I'll see you there. Craig. Thanks so much. You got it, buddy. I'll see you in, in a couple hours. All right. Thank you. You know what I love about fantasy sports is that even though I'm not going to be a great basketball player or a baseball player or a football player or whatever, I feel like I get to participate and make decisions and use my knowledge of these different leagues to, or these different sports to, to compete. So it's like I can pick my team or I can pick my favorite players and I could use my knowledge to make predictions and maybe even make money. So with the basketball season here, you can now pick combo projections across football and basketball from the specials league on prize picks. This is a league created specifically for combo projections that include two or more players from different sports or leagues. Want to play alongside some of prize picks, favorite players like rapper Meek Mill and comedian Andrew Schultz, who's also been a guest on this podcast and I've been a guest on his. You can now find community plays under the promos tab of the app to view entries for some of the biggest names in the prize picks community each week. Look, prize picks even offers a reboot policy so that your entries stay in play. Even if one of your players gets injured for football and basketball games, if you have a player who exits the game in the first half and does not return in the second, that player is rebooted. Prize picks is the only daily fantasy sports platform with an injury insurance policy. What? So, I love playing it. I love anywhere where I can use analytical ability with my interests to demonstrate some skill and maybe make some money. And I like the game like aspect. I do wish they had chess as a category on prizepicks.com, but I'll set up for what they've got. Maybe I should make my own fantasy chess league. But in any case, I love prize picks. Go to prizepicks.com slash James. Use code James for a first deposit match up to $100. That's the easiest $100 you're ever going to make. So that's prizepicks.com slash James and use code James. Daily fantasy sports made easy. Thanks for coming back on, Craig. I really appreciate it. Yeah, of course. Yeah, I think the last you guys left off is when, you know, you talk about bringing the girl back to the studio. <laughs> 
So did she become a long-term girlfriend? I mean, she, she must have fallen in love with you after that. No, we did stay in touch. She ended up um, marrying a, a guy in the music industry. Uh, she had like one or two kids with him. And she checks in with me from time to time. And it's funny because uh, um, this is going to sound really whatever it's going to sound like, but I, I don't know if you ever make notes next to, next to somebody's name in your phone so you know how to remember them. And in my phone, her name is followed by Eddie Van Halen's couch. <laughs> <laughs> so. so if you, uh, if, you uh, if someone stumbles on your black book and it's all, all these people are identified by the locations of yeah. where you were intimate with them. Consummated the relationship, yeah. <laughs> yes, that might be, that might get you into trouble depending on who picks it up. Yeah, yeah. And so how long did you stay with Eddie? I was, I lived there from January till about April or May of 2004. I was there for four or five months. And, you know, I understand what it's like. Like I, I remember one time I was in a toxic relationship it ended poorly and i rather than dealing with the consequences of figuring out how to live i just like you a, a, a friend offered hey why don't you just stay here and i moved in and it was great and it really did help me bridge that gap a after the toxic relationship did, did it did this help you um well there's a ps to this story that's that's not a good one you, you're married to the ex um, worse. Uh, I found out a year after I moved out that Ed's assistant, my friend, Matt, Maddie was hooking up with her the whole time and they stayed together for five years and they almost got married. Oh my God. So wait, maybe <laughs> this is why, is this why he, did he feel a little guilty? And he said, why don't you talk to Eddie Van Halen? Because a, I can't talk to you about this for obvious reasons. And B, you'll feel better. <laughs> you know, I never thought about that angle of it at, at that moment. That's, that's a good point. I never thought about that. But there was a, a sign that when I moved... Okay, so Ed says, look, stay with me. It's okay. You can stay in the studio. Stay as long as you want. And I'm like, all right, cool. So I go to her place. I, I get all my stuff together. And while I'm at her house, her phone is ringing, the answering machine comes on, and it's Maddie, uh, Ed's assistant. He's leaving her a message. And he's not only leaving her a message, he's, he's using a cool guy voice. Like, he's leaving a message like, hey, what's up? Just want to say how you doing. Give me a call, okay? Okay. All right. Hey, I'll talk to you soon. And I was oh, like, Craig, that's not a clue. <laughs> yeah. That's well, here's the thing. It, I wanted to give him the benefit of the doubt. And um, when I went back to the house, uh, I saw him and I said, hey, man, uh, I need to talk to you. Um, when I was at Shelly's earlier today and I was getting my stuff, I heard you on her answer machine. While I was getting my stuff. And he's like, oh, dude, is that is that bad? And I said, well, just. Let me finish. Um, I can't have, I need to just get her out of my life. And I can't have my friends continuing to talk to her. It's just, it's, it's just going to make it really hard for me. And he, he just promised me, hey, don't worry about it. It's done. I won't ever reach out to her. It's cool. It's cool. It's cool. It's cool. Um, a year after I moved out, I got a text from her <laughs> saying, I'm in love with Maddie. And giving her the benefit of the doubt, I texted her back and said, Maddie who? Like, <laughs> like just, um, which, which Maddie? Because I only know one Maddie. So, um, and, 
I've only ever heard of one Maddie now, and that's your friend Maddie. Yeah. <laughs> well, there's a great comedian, Maddie Goldberg, who uh, who lives in New York, or I think he's in L.A. now. But but yeah, he he's 90 years old after spending 70 years in the Catskills. Yeah, doing yeah. comedy. <laughs> yeah, it is a very Catskills sounding name, but um, uh, but yeah, and um, so I mean, as much as that hurt, I instantaneously knew, like, all right, well. Okay, I I got a good story out of this, so I'm just gonna pull back and um, and I st- you know stopped talking to Maddie, but I also stopped talking to Ed, and then um, years later I I started to realize well this had nothing to do with Ed, so I called him up one night and um, I hadn't talked to him in a long time. This is uh, a few years ago, and he picked up the phone. I said uh, he goes hello and i go hey ed what's going on man and he goes who's this and i said it's craig Gass." and he went hey craig how's it going man and i said i'm doing good buddy how are you and he said i'm just sitting on the toilet taking a shit and i was like oh all right you want me to call you later he said no talk to me what's going on i got all the time in the world and i was like no i'll i'll call you later i'll, I'll just uh you know and i just i felt really nervous and i just hung up so um but he uh uh, was happy to hear from me. And unfortunately, that was the last time I talked to him. Oh, he was no. sitting on the toilet, uh, going to the bathroom. Yeah. So. And do you think he knew? Oh, the, dude. She, like, she, her and Maddie were together for five years. So, yeah, there, she started uh, becoming part of their lives as well. And uh, so, yeah, he... Um, he knew, and we never got to have, uh, uh, at that point, we never, like, Eddie and I never got to finish uh, hashing out everything that had happened, so. I mean, there's always, there's that saying that's a cliche, but things are cliche because they often represent truth, which is never meet your heroes. And yeah. um, you've met, you know, you've been part of, an intense part of many subcultures, and I'm sure you've met many of your heroes. Um, but it sounds like Eddie Van Halen was a net positive for you in many ways. W- w- would you? What do you think about that comment? Never meet your heroes. Would you have been better off? Hey, I love this guy's music. I'm not going to move into his house. <laughs> no, a hundred percent. It was a, everything about it was positive. I mean, um, he was incredibly warm and affectionate to me the only thing that was unusual about it is that I was pretty much a stranger to him in, in terms of, you know, I, I didn't feel like I knew him well enough that I could live with him, but he, he just reached out like uh, to extend that invitation to me because he knew that I needed a place to go and said, stay with me. It's okay. And, um, and I stayed with him um, until, you know, for that, uh, for that first half of, uh, 2004. So I was able to get on my feet and then, uh, and I just witnessed just this insanity of, you know, I've been around a lot of, you know, I worked with Howard Stern, who is a super famous person and being on the inside of their worlds is very interesting. You for, you start to forget how famous the person is. And then every once in a while, somebody comes along that reminds you, oh yeah, man, this guy, this guy's famous as shit. But no one came into that world uh, over at Ed's house. He was so insulated. And again, he was such a hermit. He never left. And there would be moments where, um, uh, like I, I remember one night uh, hanging out with him in the studio and talking about uh, heartbreak. He was getting out of a relationship himself that he had been in for a few months and um, and we were sitting uh, at, at in the studio and he had a guitar in his hand. We were talking and talking and talking. And he said, hold on, let me, let me record this real quick. And he played a guitar solo. And then when he got done, I was looking at him and I said, man, I, I've been to so many Van Halen shows and I have to tell you my favorite part of any Van Halen concert I've ever been to 
was in the middle of the show when you would play your guitar solo and in the middle of your guitar solo where you would play this piece that was this surreal sound that you would make come out of your guitar that you called cathedral. And he said, oh, dude, sit down. And I said, no, I wasn't, that wasn't me trying to get you to play it. I just, and he goes, oh, Craig, sit down. And I was like, all right. And I sat down and he played a 10 minute version of that piece for me. And I, it was just me and him in the room. And I just remember thinking that this is just, this is crazy. This is insane. He was always nice to me. He was always uh, supportive of me. And when it came to that girl, he was protective over me. So, um, so he was fully aware of what his assistant was doing when his assistant started dating her. And he had his opinions about her, but his assistant was dating her. And so it's like, all right, you know. You, 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 you mentioned a story on, I think it was Facebook, where you were dating someone else and she didn't know necessarily your your friendship with Eddie Van Halen and she's making a video for your birthday and records Eddie Van Halen and he doesn't know who she is. It's the same girl. And hilarity ensues. It's the same girl. It was, um, so I moved in in uh, like late January of 2004 and Ed says, you know, you can stay as long as you need to to get over this girl. And uh, there were nights where I'd be heading out to the comedy store and I'd be walking to the car and Ed would follow me out and go, Hey, let me come with you. I want to watch some stand up." And I said, Ed, I'm, I'm going to an open mic. I, I'm, I'm not showing up at an open mic with Eddie Van Halen. It'll be too <laughs> disruptive. It's just, but please do me a favor. I'm doing a big show at the comedy store on Valentine's Day. Just come to that show. That's that's a show I want everybody to see. And he said, all right, I'll go see this show. And um, so Valentine's Day, Valentine's Day rolls around. And I had a moment of weakness on the 13th. On the 12th or 13th, I did the Tom Likas show in LA at a live, it was like a live um, appearance, a public appearance that he was doing. And I joined him on the air. And my ex showed up at the appearance looking stunning. Hmm. And I, I just, I ended up hooking up with her that night and invited her to my Valentine's Day show. And I, I felt ashamed to the point where I didn't tell anybody else about it. And so she shows up and Valentine's Day, I'm doing my big show at the comedy store and she's in my dressing room with a video camera because my birthday is February 15th and she's filming everybody in the dressing room wishing me a happy birthday. Ed comes walking in, smoking a cigarette. He has no idea who she is. And he walks in and she goes, hi, Ed. Um, do you have a birthday message you want to give to Craig and make a birthday wish? And he said, oh, yeah. Are you rolling? My birthday wish is uh, for Craig to get rid of that skank whore that's ruining his life. And she's like, and her jaw dropped. And I, I was in the, I was right there when it happened. I said, uh, how about you, Skippy? Keep rolling. Here, keep rolling. Uh, Skippy, here, what's your birthday wish? Here, just, and I just tried to keep the momentum going. And she asked me afterwards, um, you know, who, who, who's he talking about? And I said, so there's nobody else in my life that like, you're the girl, you're the one that, that did that thing. And he's, he has no idea who you were. Yeah. Just a few weeks earlier now. Yeah. But now though, looking at it in this light, maybe he did know who she was and he knew the situation with Maddie and maybe he's giving her the message instead of you, the message. Yeah. You know what? I don't know because Maddie was there as well. I, I don't know. Um, I just, um, you know, I, I just was bummed out that they did that to me, but I was also kind of like, so, uh, shell shocked. But I was like, wow, what a, what an incredible thing to happen. Like, you know, my girl and my friend got together behind my back and like, wow, this is crazy. Cause I'm hanging out with him that whole time up until the time I got the news. 
that she was hooking up with him. And I was, I had no idea. And he's not only hanging out with me as my friend, he's looking at me in the face and saying, are you okay? How are you doing? Are you doing all right, man? While he's banging her. So yeah, it was, it was pretty surreal. But it's interesting though, how free Eddie felt just to say what was on his mind. Like, I feel like there's, there's like, it's not a, it's not a spectrum of fame. You know, they always say, oh, it's A through D. There's like this spectrum. I don't feel that's the case. I feel like there are people who are known. There are people who are well-known and then there is famous. Eddie Van Halen, you know, if you take like, like, like we all love Dave Chappelle. He's the, let's arguably one of the most famous comedians in the world. We all love him. He's great. But I would say the percentage of people on the planet who have heard any Dave Chappelle joke is one tenth of 1% compared to people who have listened to the song jump. Oh yeah. Well, Cause 100%. music is just, it's more primal. It's, 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 we had music before we could speak even. Yeah. So it's somehow that just, we're attached to it so much more than anything else. Agreed. And he was so special as a guitar player. Nothing had ever sounded like that before he came along. He did something with a guitar that nobody had ever done. Um, I heard a recent interview where um, I think it was Ted Nugent had said um, that in a, on an early tour, he just wanted to play through his equipment. Like, I, I want to feel that sound. And he used Eddie's guitar through that equipment and it didn't sound right. It didn't sound the same. But the way Eddie would play, he created a sound the way he played. His his style of playing created that sound. But he also did this finger tapping thing that nobody had ever heard. Um, he was making sounds out of a guitar that nobody else had ever done before. And he did it on multiple albums. Um, every one of them, starting with Eruption, was just this mind-blowing thing for everybody who loved music. Right, so Eruption, take that song as a great example, and that's like was out in 1976 or 70. It was on their first album. Yep. And his guitar solo, like you said, has something like that. There's no notes, right? He's playing. It's almost like how you described when you are learning a new voice, you're finding almost the right notes, the right persona. You're listening over and over to the the person. It's almost like you inhabit that person to deliver the voice and he's inhabiting some kind of emotion and then it's expressing itself through this guitar solo that really has no notes it's a it's a sound that he's invented yeah it's it's eruption is just a guitar solo it's not uh there's no no um lyrics to it it's just it's just a guitar solo and yeah there's um he's uh he's playing so fast and it speeds up speeds up and then it hits this climax that is a sound nobody had ever heard before and when they saw him play live they realized he was using both hands to play the guitar at the same time um and nobody had ever thought to play like that and i guess for ed in interviews he would say um well i just needed more hands it just you know, I was playing and I wanted to get more notes out of my guitar and I realized, oh, I can just use both hands to get all those notes out. And and for him, it wasn't uh, anything crazy. It was just necessity. It's like, well, that's, that's how you get there is you can use both your hands to get all the notes that you want out of it. But nobody else had ever done that before. And then the other part of it was that they're playing a style of music that appealed to musically to angry young boys. And it was usually angry looking musicians playing it. But these guys, especially Ed, had huge smiles on their face. <laughs> they were so happy while they were playing this heavy sound with what can only what has only been referred to as like a California feel to it. A Southern California summertime beach feel. But it was heavy but it was uh, happy. You know? and, and, and it's sort of like they started at an interesting time. It was coming out of that, that, you know, metal hard rock of 
let's say Led Zeppelin, Ozzy Osbourne slash Black Sabbath, yep, all those guys. But before punk, which was almost like an anti music movement in some way or an anti, you know, chord style music. Yeah. And so it's hard to categorize Van Halen. They're def they're they look like a hair band. They almost sound metal, but they're not. There's a yeah. there's also a pop feel to it as well. Yeah, they, they were coming out at the time that uh, musically they were closer to an audience that loved uh, Judas Priest, Iron Maiden, um, and this was America's answer to that. Mm. And, uh, and they were, again, they, they were smiling and happy. It, was, it, 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 it stood out so much because of how unique it was. Sometimes you listen to a band. Let's say a friend of yours says, hey, come out and hear my band. We've been playing for 10 years. And, and you go out and listen to them, and they sound like every other band. And then, yeah. of course, there's the Van Halens and, and every other great, famous, 100 million album-selling band where their sound is distinctly theirs. Mm -hmm. And I always wonder, why don't all the other bands know that they're no good because <laughs> they don't have a unique sound? Like, like, think of U2. Nobody is like yeah. U2. Nobody's like Pink Floyd. No one's like Led Zeppelin. There is no comparison. Well, and sometimes for them, they, ha they struggle trying to sound like who they love, but they can't because they have a unique sound, and then they just end up developing their own sound, even though they, they might have been inspired by and tried to emulate. Because comics, when comics first start out, you can hear where they're where they're coming from by their influence in the way that they talk and and by the the way they set up their materials. Like, oh, this guy sounds like this. This guy sounds like that. Right. Um, and you can tell where they're who their influence is. And um, and musically, uh, it's. I mean, I'm not a musician, but I hear that a lot from musicians that they're that they are also trying to find their sound. But but then there's also and you can do this in music. You can't do this in comedy. When a sound is really successful, then labels that would put out music would say, all right, we want you to go in that direction because that's selling right now. And you'll start to hear a lot of artists who will sound like you know, this artist. You know, it's like um, if heavy metal is like when Quiet Riot first broke out of the L.A., metal scene it's like all right well what else have we got in la that sounds like that and then rat and motley crew and all those la metal bands came out after that you know even in the grunge era pearl jam was that sound that unique grunge sound so years later it's well we got creed and we got silver chair and we you know bands that that if you like that you'll like this but van halen again, just had a thing that you couldn't copy because they had the greatest guitar player. I mean, that eruption was such a statement of nobody can touch this. And then you had a singer who was the most flamboyant, uh, cocky, arrogant, but just likable enough that the arrogance and the cockiness just was wildly entertaining right next to him. Um, a guy that critics would love to slam, would get joy out of making fun of, but he was standing next to a guy who made this whole thing bulletproof because he was the greatest guitarist that had ever come along. And, you know, he, it's interesting because he and his brother Alex started off when they were just tiny little kids learning classical music but by ear, right? They didn't know, they didn't learn the traditional, oh, here's your scales, here's the notes for Beethoven's, you know, mini classics. They just learned it and started improvising around it. Do you think it's a 10,000 hour rule thing or do you think they just had this like natural organic talent from the beginning? Maybe a combination of both. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know his son also was very talented. There's a really funny uh story that um did i tell you the story about his son asking him about playing guitar no but i saw it on your instagram um ed um 
when I was living there, uh, Wolfie, his son, was playing guitar now for, I think, a couple of years at that point. And he was telling me about how his son asked him, uh, hey, dad, I, I, I want to... I want to learn how to play guitar. And Eddie Van Halen said, okay, all right, well, I'll find somebody to teach you. And he said, but I want to learn from you. And he goes, oh, okay. I didn't know. Okay. 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 You know, like he greatest guitar player that ever lived. And when his son says, I want to learn how to play guitar, his first thought is like, all right, I got to find a professional, (laughs) you know? And, uh, yeah, I thought that was pretty amazing. And, um, he, um, uh, he starts teaching his, his son how to play guitar. Behind his back, his son starts teaching himself how to play this instrumental. On the album For Unlawful Carnal Knowledge, there's a track on there called 316. And 316 is an acoustic piece that Ed would play on Valerie's belly when she was pregnant with mm-hmm. Wolfie. And... It, whenever Wolfie would kick, uh, Ed would put the acoustic guitar on her belly and start playing this piece, and it would calm and soothe Wolfie. So Wolfie wants to learn guitar. He's got a, he's got a talent show that he's going to play at, at his school, and it's going to be the first time he's ever played on uh, guitar on stage. Eddie, really excited and proud, goes to the talent show, brings his video camera along, and when it's time for Wolfie to come up, Eddie sneaks down to the front row and gets his camera out and starts filming. And this kid walks out and says, Hey everybody, my name's Wolfie. And, um, I'm going to play a piece of music that my dad wrote that he used to play when I was in my mom's belly. This is called three sixteen, And he started playing it. And Eddie said, tears were just, falling down his face as it happened and when you hear that and by the way 316 it was it was called that because 316 is wolfie's birthday oh really it's my daughter's birthday it's funny really wow yeah so you know you mentioned something earlier about how you know musicians are, are you know first they're imitating others and then they're finding their voices like you look at the rolling stones their influences obviously were like Chuck Berry, a lot of older blues, and then mm-hmm. they started to develop their own voice maybe five, six years into it. And then there's like this seven year period where they're the best in the world. And then after that, they're just touring off of that seven year period. Mm-hmm. And it seems to happen to a lot of bands, including Van Halen in terms of their most famous, successful music. Not that they don't create good music afterwards, but that's the that seven year period from like 1976 to 1984 is mm-hmm. how most people know them Mm -hmm. and why do you think it's seven years in most cases i mean give or take i don't know i mean some people are very uh prolific i mean it's interesting because you know when when sammy joined the band they ended up getting their first ever number one single with sammy oh really jump was i thought jump was number one um jump uh, oh wait you know what jump was the first number one single the first album with Sammy was the number one album. Ah. They had never had a number one album and they had one with Sammy. And, um, and uh, right now I think had may have been bigger than anything else they had ever put out. I, um, but yeah, it, it's, it's, you know, the same thing with uh, happens with, comedians although it's kind of cool this thing has developed in the last uh 10 15 years of comedy and i and louis ck seemed to kind of lead the way with this that louis ck would just start putting out a brand new hour every two years or every year or two years every year and uh prior to that when we were kids growing up loving comedy our favorite comedians would not turn their material over very much. And, and if you heard about your favorite comedian, I mean, even George Carlin, who was inc- probably one of the most prolific comedians ever, um, whenever he would do a Tonight Show appearance, I was always dialed in, and he would end up working in material that I'd already seen on that Tonight Show, and it would bum me out. And Louis was one of those first guys to start just challenging himself to come up with new material all the time. 
And since then, that's becoming the norm. Comedians uh, talk about uh, putting out their, their new hour special and then starting from scratch. And um, uh, musicians uh, obviously have always had to put out new music, but there's that weird thing where you can hear a good song thousands of times. You can't hear a comedy piece more than a couple of times. There's very few comedians. I mean, there's some like Bert does um, uh, The Machine and closes out his set now by repeating this piece of comedy that everybody already knows. I did shows with Pablo Francisco in Australia and his closing bit, his free bird was doing the preview guy uh, voice that the Arnold Schwarzenegger, the tortilla man or whatever that was. And, um, but musicians can only, uh, musicians can keep, uh, repeating and playing songs. People expect to hear those classic songs. And, Wait, and not only that music gets better, uh, the ear yeah. likes listening to repetition in music, yeah. but not necessarily with stories or yeah. you know, co comedy it's comedy. Yeah. And I don't think people really understand why that's the case i guess again music attaches itself is uh triggers a different part of the brain which mm -hmm. is why people who stutter often won't stutter uh well, through through if they're singing yeah like gabby giffords the arizona congresswoman who she was shot in the brain and she, uh -huh. had, she couldn't speak afterwards but she could uh when she was starting to get a little better she still couldn't speak but she could sing as opposed to speaking it wow that's that's the first i heard of that i didn't know that Oh my gosh, I love these clothes. Mizzen and Main, that's M-I-Z-Z-E-N and Main. It really is the most comfortable work clothes. Travel clothes, I'm tra I am had to travel this whole week. I'm traveling for a week and a half and I just took Mizzen and Main clothes with me. Close out 2023 in style with comfortable, breathable, packable, and machine washable pieces from Mizzen and Main. As you wrap up your year-end goals, enjoy a Mizzen and Main dress shirt that you can wear confidently. I like that they've very, very just nice, solid colors. I don't really like to get all fancy in patterns and everything, although they do have some pattern shirts, but very comfortable clothes, stretchable pants. It's just super comfortable, but they look professional and they, you can wear them casually or professionally. I like some of their flannel shirts or untuck shirts. I love untuck. I never tuck in. So again, uh, whether you're shopping for a special someone or giving yourself the gift you really want, I just buy myself gifts. Mizzen and Maine is the perfect gift for any guy who works, travels, and or cares about looking and feeling great. As you could tell by my many photos across the internet, I care about looking fantastic. I'm practically a model. And let's be honest, Every guy loves to look great. So again, shop now at mizzenandmain.com and save 20% when you spend $130 or more using promo code James. That's promo code James at mizzenandmain, M-I-Z-Z-E-N and main.com. Small business owners are savvy and know how to get maximum value from their monthly business purchases. The Enhanced American Express Business Gold Card is designed to take your business further. It is packed with benefits and features like four times membership rewards points that automatically adapt to your top two eligible spending categories every month on up to $150,000 in purchases per year. So you earn more where your businesses spend the most plus up to $395 in annual statement credits on eligible business purchases at select shipping, food delivery, and retail subscription merchants. So with flexible spending capacity that adapts to your business and access to 24-7 support from a business card specialist, you can continue to run your business with confidence. The Amex Business Gold Card, now smarter and more flexible. It's got the powerful backing of American Express. Enrollment required, terms apply. Learn more at americanexpress.com slash businessgoldcard. The future of learning is definitely online. Like it's such BS 
that you have to spend $200,000 or take $200,000 in loans and go to some fancy school when it's useless. It doesn't guarantee you a job. Most employers, including me, do not care about degrees or grades or anything like that. We want to care that you love what you're doing, that you know what you're doing, in some cases that you have experience or that you're willing to learn. But people in general love learning and are curious. Like the key to success is curiosity. And I think masterclass.com is the perfect model for online learning. I'm really happy they're, they're sponsoring uh, this episode. If you're going to give a gift, give the gift of learning. Masterclass makes a meaningful gift this season for you and anyone on your list because both of you can learn from the best to become your best from leadership to effective communication to cooking. Let me tell you some of the classes I've taken. I've taken comedy from Steve Martin. I mean, can you believe I can take a class from Steve Martin on comedy or Judd Apatow, my favorite comedy director. I could take an actual class from him on writing. Wolfgang Puck on cooking. Dan Brown on writing. Or Judy Bloom, who's been on this podcast, on writing. By the way, Wolfgang Puck also has been on this podcast. It's such a pleasure. I, I try to take classes all the time from masterclass.com. And whether you're watching Masterclass on TV or listening in audio mode in the app or on their site, the quality speaks for itself. It's like these Masterclass instructors are your own personal mentors that are going to help you reach the next level. How much would it cost to take one-on-one -on -one classes on comedy from Steve Martin or on chess from Gary Kasparov? You just wouldn't be able to do it. But it would, I mean, it would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars. With a Masterclass annual membership, it's $10 a month. Membership started at $120 a year for unlimited access to one-on-one -on -one classes with all 180-plus Masterclass instructors. So it's not just $120 for one instructor. You get all 180-plus Masterclass instructors. Boost your confidence and find practical takeaways you can apply to your life and at work. And if you own a business or are a team leader, use Masterclass to empower and create future-ready employees and leaders. That's the real education in today's world. So this holiday season, you can give one annual membership and get one free at masterclass.com slash JAS. JAS, of course, stands for the James Altucher Show. So right now you can get two memberships for the price of one at masterclass.com slash JAS. Masterclass.com slash JAS. Offer terms apply. You mentioned how musicians find their voice, comedians find their voice. You know, obviously you had this unusual story and this unusual talent, which is good, I think, in comedy when people bring outside talents into their comedy. It's a good way to establish your uniqueness, but you still have to find your voice. And so what, what happened? Like, how did you get into comedy and then start finding your voice? I started um, because I was made fun of and mocked by a bunch of comedians at an open mic um, in Tucson, Arizona. I did an open mic in 1990 that I just did for fun. Uh, friends of mine had said, hey, you're really funny. You should be a comedian. And I went to an open mic and invited 30 of my friends to come watch me. Not realizing that you're supposed to prepare material. It always looked to me like people just walked up on stage and just started talking. And I thought, all right, I'll, I'll do that. And I bombed horribly. I walked up on stage. I had no idea how bright the lights were. And I had no idea how loud the microphone was going to be. And there is an intensity when you stand on stage to do a comedy set of people just staring at you, waiting for you to be funny, that shook me to my core. And I... I I made one joke. I made a joke about how scared I was on stage. And then I looked around and I just said, I, I can't do this. And I, I, my hands were shaking so bad. I couldn't even put the microphone back in the stand. My hands were shaking so bad. The MC had to come up and help me. And then uh, I sat down. Pablo Francisco was actually at that open mic. And uh, I sat down and watched every other open micer get on stage and they started shitting on me. They, and they weren't making jokes. They would, I remember one guy said, uh, he goes, uh, hey, how about that guy who bombed tonight? Was that, uh, hey, was that you? 
that, that was you that was on stage? Dude, what, why are you here? Yeah, you suck, dude. Like oh that's my God. It, yeah, it was just it was just bullying. And after uh, after that night, it just became this black pit in my stomach for years that I was made fun of at the in an environment where I really should have excelled because it's the one thing that comes natural to me. It's just trying to be funny. And um, it came up like my friends would make fun of me for it. I'd be at weddings and I would stand up at a wedding and say, hey, um, I just want to say a couple words uh, uh, because I've known you guys for a long time. I just want to say, and someone in the back of the room would go, I can't do this. And I'd go, who said that? Who said that? Like they, my friends would mock me for it. And there was a local DJ in Tucson, long story short, who just said that, uh, he said, I, I think you're missing your calling in life. And, uh, I think you should be doing stand-up comedy. And I said, man, I, I tried that and it did not work. And he said, well, when, go to an open mic and you need to just say to yourself, I am funny and I belong here. And I literally said that at every open mic for the next couple months. I would walk in and I, I, before I went on stage, I'd go, I'm funny. I belong here. And then I'd walk up on stage, I'd do my thing. And then I realized it was actually really effortless. And um, I moved to Seattle to start doing stand-up. And, uh, and then everything started clicking. I started hitting open mics uh, in 1993 with Josh Wolf. Then Joey Diaz showed up, and then wow. Brody Stevens, and wow. we all all started out together, and um, and then we all started going around the country. And I started doing radio at the exact same time in 1993. Then I started working for Howard in 1995. Then I started uh, when I started writing for Howard in 1998. I just thought I, I I should go back home to New York, and I moved back home to New York uh, where I where I was born and where I spent the first 10 years of my life. I moved in with another comedian, Mitch Hedberg, and I started writing for Howard. I started writing for Weekend Update. And then in 2001, Howard, uh, Jackie, the joke man, quit the show. Howard invited me to come in for two days to do an audition. And two days turned into two days a week, every week for the next uh, 10 months, eight to 10 months. And then, um, and then that launched my career. And then I ended up on uh, Sex and the City, King of Queens, Law and Order, et cetera, et cetera. And then and I've been, uh, I've been surviving. I've been able to pay my bills and my mom's bills ever since. Wow. So your mom and, and what did you, when your parents saw that you were doing stand-up and also doing these uh, impressions and they knew, first off, they couldn't hear you, right? So what was... What was that like for them, for you? You couldn't totally express your talent to them, even though they were, your talent was a direct result of coming out of that household. Yeah, they, they would. Well, it's interesting because I used to do impressions for my family that involved no voices. It was just impressions of, like, if you were our next door neighbor, I would say, okay, this is James walking to school. And then I would do an impression of you. And it was just, I, I was so dialed into people's body language that I would just do an impression of your body language and it would kill. <laughs> I was like, just, I was so, uh, hyper aware of body language and, um, and then being able to do voices just kind of cemented that you know, those, those traits, you know, and, um, Wait. When you're writing for things like Weekend Update, though, or or when you were, and you know, were you writing in impressions? Like, how come you didn't make that automatically a part of your comedy right from the beginning? That was um, I, I I started going to SNL because I met a guy. I went to an an open mic at a was it an open mic or a comedy show? I think it was an open mic. It was at a place called Ye Old Triple N that used to be directly across the street from the doors to studio 54. Mm -hmm. And they had a comedy show there once, once a week. And I had a set there one night that didn't go over well. It was a really rough crowd. And a guy offered to buy me a drink afterwards and said, Hey man, I thought you were funny. Can I get you a drink? And, um, and we started talking and he was a cue card guy at SNL. 
Mm-hmm. So I told him, I've always, it's been a dream of mine just to go. And so he hooked me up and he started letting me into SNL a few times. Like I started going once every couple of weeks SNL and I met Colin Quinn up there and said, Hey Colin, I'm a comedian. And we would start talking. And I said, uh, I do voices on, on the Howard Stern show. And Colin was a huge Howard Stern fan and he knew who I was and he would have me do impressions for everybody at the show. And, and, um, and then one night when I had hit this guy up like three Saturdays in a row and that third Saturday, he let me in and I could tell he was getting aggravated by like, dude, you're, you know, I'll get you in, but you know, and you could feel it like, dude, you're, you're kind of overextending your welcome here. And that night, knowing that I probably wasn't coming back again, I hit up Colin and said, uh, hey, I have a comedian friend who says that he writes for you. Do you know who this guy is? And it was somebody I worked with at Stand Up New York. Hmm. Wow. Colin said, oh, yeah, yeah, that guy. I, yeah, I know that guy. You know? And I said, oh, I go, you know, I write for Howard Stern. Would you be okay with me sending you material? And he said, yeah, yeah. And he wrote down a phone number for a fax machine at SNL. And he said, just... Uh, on the weeks that we're live, just send me jokes by 5 p.m. on Friday. But they have to be in by, by 5 p.m. on Friday. And I was like, all right. And I wasn't, a, I wasn't that style of writer. But I got... Yeah, like I feel like, and, and sorry to interrupt, but I feel like, for instance, Mitch Hedberg, who you live with, mm-hmm. he was a writer's writer of comedy. Absolutely. Like, it's hard to write with the beautiful simplicity mm-hmm. that he has. And yeah. there's maybe three or four I could think of like that, like a Stephen Wright and then yes. whoever else. But yeah, cause you're, a lot of your comedy is stories and yes. then the impressions. Yep. It's a little harder to do the, uh, to, to, to do a 12 word thing with a punchline at the end. A hundred percent. And it felt like I was trying to squeeze blood out of a stone the first couple weeks that I did it. But over time, it got easier. The process got easier. And when I would watch the news or read the newspaper, jokes started coming to me easier. I started flexing that muscle. I started working out that muscle and it did get easier. It reminds me kind of of doing roasts. I am not a mean person at all. And I've done a few roasts that the first time I did a roast, I, it was a roast of Gene Simmons and I, I locked myself in a hotel room in Marina del Rey for like four days and try to think of mean shit. And it was really hard. And I remember at, I, would, I would sit there and just stare at a piece of paper for like hours and hours at a time and write a couple things. And then at the end of the day, I would call a bunch of my comedian friends and I'd go, hey, this is what I got. What do you think of this? And I would run it through everybody and I'd get some notes. And the next day, I would tighten it up a little bit and then some things started dropping out of my head. And then the next day, more things started dropping out. And then I, I got into a flow. If you force yourself in that direction, you haven't, if you're funny, naturally, you can, you can exercise that muscle and develop that ability if you force yourself in that direction. And, and, um, but after a while, I started getting better and better at writing stuff that was topical although that's not my comedy. No, my comedy is just sharing my experiences on stage and, and just sharing them in a funny way. I can't do topical material, but, but for, what was it a year and a half? It was like, I want to say it was like October of 98 till May of 2000, which was his final show. I was submitting material to him. If he liked the joke and if he used it on the air you got a hundred bucks and i only got one joke in for that entire uh two season frame and in may of 2000 i got really hammered on that last show uh because kid rock was the music guest and a a friend of mine kenny was playing guitar for kid rock and i got drunk during the show and i actually walked up to lorne michaels when the show wrapped before everybody left to go to the party. And I said, Hey Lauren, I don't, my name's Craig. I'm, I write for Colin. I'm a comedian and, but I do the best impressions. And, and Lauren said, yeah, well call me. And he told me when to call. He said, I don't know if he gave me a number. He said, call NBC, ask for this person, but just give me a few weeks. Cause I'm going to be gone for a while and, and we'll talk about it. And then, uh, I called a few weeks later and said, Hey, Lauren told me to call. 
And whoever I talked to said, okay, well, have your agent contact us. And I said, uh, well, what if I don't have an agent? And the guy said, you don't have an agent. He said, well, I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what to do. I'd never been in a situation like that before. And I was so ashamed huh. that I didn't call them again. I was like, oh, my oh. God. Yeah. And then a few years ago, I ran into... Um, oh, okay. And I'm sorry to interrupt, but my, I'm wondering if this thought crossed your mind. If you, you could have just, they could have said, hey, have your agent call us. And you could have said, no problem. And <laughs> then you call CAA and said, SNL told me to have yep. my agent call yeah. them. Yeah. Who over there is my agent? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or, or just call back and just do a Tracy Morgan impression and just like, yeah. <laughs> I'm Craig Gass's agent. He's sexy <laughs> as hell. We need to set something up. That's crazy. <laughs> That's crazy. Like, yeah. <laughs> But yeah, I, but, uh, I, I finally, I came back in and, uh, years later and connected with that girl. And I can't think of her name, that blonde haired girl that was dating, um, Ben Affleck for a while. And, and we did a little bit of a dance. She asked me to submit material and more material. And then I never got to the, um, screen test. That's all I, honest to God. I just want to be able to do that screen test and I'd be happy with just doing that because the screen test takes place in the studio at SNL. And all I wanted was to be able to stand on the same stage that only the greatest, some of the greatest that have ever lived have stood on. And I wanted to be able to do that once and I haven't had that chance yet. So, you know, I wonder if you felt like you needed to be in the mold of a classic comedian, because even take the Gene Simmons roast where you're struggling to come up with material you have this great impression of gene simmons Mm -hmm. what if what if you just set a context like okay gene simmons falls in love with like an english professor and yeah and he's just head over heels and she doesn't even know who he is and then boom you start doing your gene simmons impression like just trying to quote poetry and like begging her to like him and well, that was the funny thing is doing the impressions and how much of a reach I would get when I was on the Howard Stern show because I started, like I had uh, it, I had a conversation with Howard off the air about Gene Simmons and how unbelievably confident he is. And Howard thought it was so funny and he had me start sharing those stories on the air. And then the conversation comes up of like, well, how could we use this impression on the air? Like what would be the point of, how do we make that into a character? And I started using it on the music guests. Every time the music guests would come in, I would constantly interrupt them as Gene Simmons and try to sell them shitty Kiss products. (laughs) And uh, which was really disruptive to the music guests, but really entertaining to the audience. And then this crazy thing happened where we found out that apparently the real Gene Simmons actually started getting hate mail because of the shit I was saying on the Howard Stern show. And the real Gene Simmons got on a plane and flew to New York to confront me live on the Howard Stern show, which was this insane moment that scared me to death, but he had a good sense of humor about it. And over the years I've gone on to perform with kiss on a couple of these events that they do uh, called the kiss cruise, where it's 3000 of the biggest kiss fans from around the world on a ship. Um, on a cruise, and uh, and it and it's funny because I went from feeling like I was a target from the band Kiss to now becoming a target from the Kiss Army, which is their fan base. Yeah, because I made a joke on one of those Kiss cruises that really upset the Kiss fans that they took very seriously. I met a girl on the Kiss cruise who was like the cruise director. She's really upbeat and peppy. She, she's like the Julie McCoy of the uh, Kiss cruise. And when she met me and she's like, oh my God, you're the comedian. You're the guy that does the voices with the family guy and the American dad. Like, oh, oh my God do you want to do a funny announcement on the ship tomorrow morning? And I was like, oh, fuck yes. Is, that, is everybody going to hear it? And she goes, yeah, it gets piped into every cabin. So the next morning, 3,000 KISS fans wake up to this announcement. Bing bong. Hey, everybody, this is Paul Stanley. 
and this is Gene Simmons from KISS. And we have a very important announcement. Do not panic, but we have a very important announcement about the KISS cruise. It seems that the KISS cruise has just hit an iceberg. Now, keep in mind, when I said we've hit an iceberg, we're in the middle of the fucking Bahamas when I said that. There's no reason for you as a reasonable person to go, this ship's going down! This ship's going down! We're in the Bahamas. But do not panic, because KISS is going to take care of everybody. We actually have three packages to get you off the ship. First, we have the platinum package. It's $5,000. We put you in a life raft, and you have your own private photo taken with kits. Then we have the diamond package. Isn't that right, Paul? That's right, the diamond package. For $10,000, where we throw you in the ocean with Tommy and Eric, and then Kiss floats by on a raft, and we do a private acoustic show in the ocean. And then everything I said was ridiculous, but apparently a couple of the fans on the Kiss cruise got upset and ran to the staff and said, is Kiss really going to charge us to get off the boat? They believed that Kiss was waiting at the exits to charge everybody as they got off the boat. So I ended up getting in trouble with the Kiss fans. What did Gene Simmons say? They all seemed to get a huge kick out of it. They they saw the comedy in it. Yeah. And Gene really has a great sense of himself, which his son has told me uh, is a recent development when I started doing that impression. His son uh, comes to the comedy store all the time in Hollywood. And his son has told me, like, my dad just started to get a sense of humor about himself right before you started showing up on the Howard Stern show. Like if you had started doing that impression, even a couple years earlier, my dad would have hunted you down and killed you. Like he had no sense of humor about shit like that. But, but he really started to like develop this ability to laugh at himself right about the time that you showed up making fun of, you know, and I'm clearly a fan. So, and, and Gene, had a great sense of humor about it. Not as much as Paul Stanley does. Paul Stanley loves, as it was told to me by somebody who works with Kiss, Paul Stanley loves when anyone makes fun of Gene. So, oh. <laughs> so Paul is always leading the way to get me to do stuff with Kiss, which is amazing. Now, I'm sure you've, you've we talked earlier about Jim Norton. I'm sure you've told him this story. Like, Jim is the biggest Kiss fan in the world. I actually took, um, so I developed this friendship with Kiss and I love bringing people to meet their idols. I'm, I'm always doing that. I'm always like a friend of mine in New England is a huge Miami Dolphins fan and he's one of the funniest comedians I've ever seen. His name's Brian Bowden. I brought him with me to Miami to be my opener just so I could bring him on the field for the mm-hmm. Miami Dolphins. He's never been to that stadium before. Um, whenever people are fans of bands, I like to bring them over to meet them. And I, I brought three, when I started to make friends with Kiss, I brought three comedians to their show at Madison Square Garden, Kiss Aerosmith tour. I brought Jeff Ross, Steve Byrne, and Jim Norton. And somebody comes up to me at some point that works for Kiss and says, hey, Craig, uh, I just want to give you a heads up the band does a thing before the concert they charge a thousand dollars for it's a you can have your photograph taken with kiss and if you guys want i can just put you in the line and you could have your picture taken and i was like it's up to you guys what do you guys want to do and all of them <laughs> like yes absolutely absolutely so they walk us into this room to get our picture taken with kiss and uh jim norton turns around and looks at us and says hey guys uh do you mind if i uh uh, get my own picture with him. Like, and I was like, I don't care. You guys care? And I'm like, yeah, go ahead. Get, get your own. So Jim wanted to take a photo by himself. Right. So <laughs> Jim walks up. Paul Stanley has no shirt on. And as is reasonable because Paul Stanley's in great physical shape. He's got no shirt on. And Jim Norton walks in front of Kiss and he goes, hi, guys. I'm Jim. How you doing? And then uh, Paul Stanley just grabs him by the neck and just says, come here like that. And, and puts like a little choke hold on him. And they set up the picture 
Again, Paul Stanley has no shirt on. He's got his arm around Jim's neck. And Jim grabs Paul Stanley's arm and just leans into his shoulder <laughs> like, like this. <laughs> and the pictures come out. It's on Jim's website somewhere. But yeah, I brought Jim into that incredibly homoerotic moment uh, in both that, of their lives. That, that's so uh, funny. I mean, I remember in sixth grade, just having like a three hour long conversation about kiss with Jim. Like he was obsessed. Yeah. And I remember his obsession included fantasies about, and he's, he's mentioned it a couple of times that his fantasy is that, and I don't know what this means about him psychologically. His fantasy is that kiss beats him up or like throws him down a flight of steps and then lets him know he's okay or hugs him. It's like this tough love thing. I don't know what the fuck that means, but yeah. That's but Jim, so funny. Jim has talked about that he just wishes that they would uh, like beat him up a little bit and kind of toughen him up. And uh, yeah. And again, I'm, I'm blown away by the fact that you've known Jim your whole life. That that um, he's one of the, uh, in my opinion, Jim has taken the throne that was previously occupied by George Carlin and that Jim uh, George was obsessed with words and the English language and the meaning of words. And Jim has the same obsession, except his target is people who try to manipulate the language to try to attach uh, um, uh, some kind of offense to the words. And, and Jim is hyper obsessed with breaking down these ideas that anybody can be offended and hurt in any way by words. And uh, I, I, I think, would you agree? Yeah, and it's, and it's interesting because with Jim, it's very much a what you see is what you get. Like mm -hmm. he can't be, you can't criticize his lifestyle or whatever, you know, I, I use that randomly, but he, it's, he's already said everything. You yeah. can't say, oh, this guy, you know, does this, this, this. Fine. That's what he, that's who he is. <laughs> yeah. And it's weird that uh, him being completely transparent makes him bulletproof. Yeah. His transparency is like, I, um, I am a pervert. I'm a sex addict. This is what I'm into. And it's very specific and... There's, it's crazy to me how much people warm up to that. You would think that that kind of uh, complete honesty would alienate people, but it, he seems to um, endear himself to people by being that honest. Well, well, you know what it does? It, it does alienate a lot of people, but it also exposes you to uh, a much larger audience yeah. because people, wa people want to see, from my experience, People want to see a train wreck in real time, and <laughs> because I because I've been there myself in in my writing and stuff, and so a lot of people will be, get alienated. But because you're in front of a much larger audience, the the smaller percentage who 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 want to see someone who's honest and authentic and and is going through is admitting to real issues, they love it. They they become. They, an avid listener, reader, you know, fan, whatever. And mm -hmm. I think that's what Jim taps into. Like he wasn't afraid of that. Yeah. Yeah. And it was, it's kind of interesting to watch his trajectory in the late nineties. I remember his standup was um, so graphic and so blunt that I, I remember there was a couple of times, there was one oral sex thing that he would do that would make would genuinely make me go oh like I, I would I would <laughs> genuinely cringe a little bit, and then he started telling stories, uh, vulnerable stories, and I, I just remember one of them was that he was on a plane, I want to say with Mike Tyson, he was sitting next to Mike, T or was it Mike Tyson, or was it? Oh no no, it was Fifty Cent. Uh -huh. it, it was Fifty Cent. Uh, on his way to Cancun to film something for MTV. And that the whole time he was sitting there thinking, man, of all the people in the world thinking about 50 Cent, I'm sitting next to him. And like, and it was so, um, it was such a sweet story that, 
he started going down this road where he, he really started um, becoming, um, instead of shocking, he became incredibly endearing and, uh, but still had that side to him. And he managed to start communicating all those dark and filthy thoughts in a way that was so much easier to swallow, so to speak. Yeah, and now, I mean, look, his, his show on Sirius is a serious show. Yeah, yeah. Like, I always see him with a, a book in his hand. Like, he's always reading to prepare for the guests. And Yeah. You know. Yeah, and, he, and, and it's amazing because I, I even love the way that he argues. He's very patient when he fights. He's, he's uh, when, uh, when a caller takes issue with something that he says or something that he does, uh, Jim, there's things that are said to him sometimes that make me angry on behalf of Jim, but Jim just continues to be patient and listen and say, well, can I ask you a question about that? And, and he will um, stay with the conversation without getting emotional about it. Yeah, no, he's, he, he's a good guy. Yeah. So when you, when did you start with Family Guy? So you do the, a lot of the celebrity voices or all the celebrity voices on Family Guy. They started calling me, um, God, I want to say it was like eight or nine years ago, I got a phone call from this woman, Linda Lamontagne, um, and she called me up and said, hey, uh, she said, hey, Craig, my name's Linda. I'm the casting director for Family Guy, American Dad, and at the time, the Cleveland show. And she said, um, um, and I want to offer you a job. I don't know if you're available. <laughs> that was, yeah. I was sitting in a long- We want you to be the Secretary of State. Yeah. I don't know. Are you doing anything else? Yeah. What's going on? And it's, I was, and it's funny because there are moments, like you would think that if the Howard Stern Show called you and said, we'd like you to be on the Howard Stern Show, that everyone would jump to do it. But there are lots of people for one reason or another who say no. Mm -hmm. And it's shocking. The same thing happens with SNL. You know, you think the SNL would be the, the end all and be all of, of all the things you could do in pop culture. But there are people who turned down SNL to host it. And she was saying, if you're available. But I was sitting in a Long John Silver's when she called me. And I was like, I am totally available. I got nothing going on right now. And she said, uh, if you want, um, I know you're based out of New York. We have a studio that we use in New York that we can talk to you on an ISDN line. Um, but if you can come to L.A., you'll actually be working with Seth in the studio in L.A. And I said, I can totally be in L.A. And, and she said, OK, um, does this date work for you? And I said, absolutely, I can do the date. And she goes, all right, uh, well, how about this? We'll do this. I agreed to everything she said. And I go, all right, I'll see you later. And I hung up. And then the night before I flew out to L.A., I'm hanging out with a bunch of comedian friends of mine uh, in New York. And I said, oh, man, did I, did I tell you guys this? I, I just got a job doing voices on fucking family guy and they were like no way and one of my friends said how much are they paying you and i went i have no idea i never even asked the question i was oh so excited i never even asked so i called up linda to say hey linda uh it's craig gas and she was like are you okay and i said yeah i'm okay I, um this is embarrassing but i never asked you how much am i getting paid to to do this session and she goes oh uh, hold on, hold on. Let's get some paperwork out. Uh, Craig Gas, Craig Gas, Craig Gas. <laughs> Craig, you're getting scale plus ten. And I said, all right, okay. So I'm getting, I'm getting scale plus ten. She goes, yeah, you're getting scale plus ten. I go, all right. So I'm, I'm scale plus ten. She goes, yeah. And I go, all right. Well, I'm getting scale plus. 10. She goes, yeah. You got any questions? And I said. Yeah, what what is scale? I, I, what scale and yeah, ten of what? I, and ten of what? Yeah, and I, I never like I used to do a lot of coke, and we would work with scales. <laughs> and I'm like, but what does this mean for payment? Like, what? It, and she had to explain to me that the union that I was a part of had negotiated a deal where every voiceover artist, no matter what, gets paid a a minimum that's referred to as scale. You get a minimum amount of payment, and then. Um, and the, the minimum at the time was $780 and it was plus 10%, which the reason why they did that is they gave you the 10% so that you could give that to your agent. So you get to keep the whole amount uh. that you're supposed to get paid. So they're kind of doing you a solid by giving you an extra 10% so that your agent gets their 10% and you get to keep that whole thing. And I had no agent. 
And, uh, and that was like, Oh, okay. $858. Like my plane ticket, I think it was $400. The rental car was like a hundred. I would have paid them to, right. to come in and do the show. And then I walk in and my first episode that I worked on, I was with Seth and they had me do, um, it was, uh, it was just me and him alone for five minutes. And Seth kept doing this one line as Peter Griffin, where he said, this is crazier than when Al Pacino was a slumlord laundromat tenant. <laughs> and then they cut to me as Al Pacino surrounded by a bunch of broken down washers and dryers going, you're out of order and you're out of order and you're all out of order. And I did that three times. And then Seth McFarlane is running the board. And he goes, all right, ma'am, I think we're good. But I'm so nervous because I actually think in my mind that we're going to be friends now, now that we're working together. So I get up and I go, hey, so uh, you want to hang out? Or, uh, and he goes, <laughs> I go, what, what do you mean hang out? I go, I don't know. You, you want to grab a coffee or something? And he goes, I got to work. And I said, all right. You want me to leave? And he goes, yeah, get the fuck out of here. And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And I got my stuff. <laughs> I walked out and I didn't hear from them again for like six months. And then Linda started calling and saying, Hey Craig, can you do this voice? We need somebody to do this voice. And I said, yes, absolutely. All right. Can you do this voice? And can you do this voice? And then when I would hear from her, I would put in the audition when they approved it, I would come in and I never saw Seth MacFarlane again. Every time I come in, it's always this guy, Mike Henry, who does the voice of Cleveland and the creepy old guy. And every time I see Mike, I'll go, hey, Mike, is, uh, is Seth around? And every time I see him, he goes, don't worry about Seth. We'll get you out of here real quick. It's like, <laughs> oh, we'll get you out of here really quick. It's like, yeah, it's so demoralizing and so depressing. But, yeah. But, you know, that, that, happens, that happens all the time. Like, I don't know. Mo, you know, I've done like six or 700 of these podcasts. And let's say Kareem Abdul-Jabbar or whatever comes on the podcast. And I think, oh, yeah, I'm going to. I'm going to call him next time I'm in LA or something. And he even, he'll, somebody like that will even say, yeah, call him, st you know, stop by when you're in LA. I've got a, a many, let's say half the people have said that. And I always call when I'm in LA. Nobody has ever picked up the phone. Really? Yeah. There's yeah. some people I felt nervous about and they'll ask like, Hey, how come you don't call? And I'm like, Oh, I don't want to bother you. You know? And they'll say, no, you can call anytime. And, uh, but yeah, I, I get, yeah, I, I, I find it hard to pick up the phone and make those calls, but, um, um, but it's been reinforced on a few occasions. Like, no, you should call anytime. Uh, but you know, what's really bad is I'll call like Paul Stanley gave me his phone number and I've only called him once. Uh, and I think it was the day after he gave me his cell phone number. And the next day I was jacked up and a little euphoric on espresso and really felt myself. So I, I dialed Paul Stanley's phone number. He picked up the phone. He goes, hello. And I said, hi, Paul, this is Gene Simmons from <laughs> kiss. And he goes, okay. And I started selling him kiss products. Oh and then, God. and then I finally stopped and said, Hey, Paul, I'm sorry. It's, it's Craig gas. I just wanted to, call and say hello and say thanks. It was great to see you last night. He goes, you know, I was going to say, you're starting to sound like that fucking comedian now. And I was like, <laughs> oh yeah. And then the more I heard Paul Stanley talk, the more I was like, I'm on the phone. The fucking." And then I just kind of lost it. And I, <laughs> and then I made up an excuse. I said, all right, uh, well, I, I got to take a shit. I'll see you later. Bye. And I hang up. <laughs> and then, uh, yeah. And I felt really anxious, but, um, yeah, I, uh, it's funny that with comedy, it is a vehicle to meet so many people who you respect and admire. I always remember a moment before I started doing stand-up of watching Eddie Murphy on The Tonight Show with Jay Leno. And Jay Leno went through a guest list that he had seen from Eddie Murphy's wedding. And he said, let me ask you a question. He said, I saw that at your wedding, you had Wayne Newton, um, Magic Johnson, uh, Tom Cruise and uh, Prince at your wedding. And he said, yeah, that's true. And he said, how do you, how does that happen? 
And Eddie said, well, he said, I'm a comedian. He said, uh, actors feel like the only people who understand them is actors. And athletes feel like they can only relate to other athletes. He said, but when you're a comedian, everybody likes having you around. And that is 100% true. I, I have had people from every walk of life that I respect and admire from musicians to athletes to astronauts who have asked me to hang out with them. And I would not be in their world if it wasn't for stand-up comedy. Cause I think, I guess there's a, again, something primal about humor, right? Mm -hmm. We laugh for a variety of reasons. There's all sorts of theoretical scientific reasons why we laugh, but the reality is everybody in the world enjoys to laugh. And then for a professional comedian, there's this aspect that some aspect of comedy is noticing the unusual in, in the mundane. So yeah. you could be around somebody and you're going to offer a different perspective than the perspective that they've been seeing every day for the past 3,000 days. And then yeah. suddenly you're there and you point out something they've never seen before. And to your point, did you watch that uh, documentary, The Last Dance, about Michael Jordan? I haven't seen it yet, no. There's a moment, and I want to say that they're in the NBA Finals when this moment happens. It may have been the playoffs, but I want to say it was the NBA Finals where Jerry Seinfeld comes into the locker room for the Bulls. And apparently him and uh, Michael Jordan have some kind of relationship. So he comes in, uh, everybody's, everybody in the Bulls is excited to see him. And they go, all right, well, listen, we got to get ready for the game. They haven't played the game yet. They're talking to Jerry Seinfeld and the game's about to happen. So Jerry goes, all right, I'll see you guys. And he walks out. And as he's walking out, there's like a chalkboard with uh, an outline of a basketball hoop. And there's a play like a design for a play on that, on the board. And Jerry walks out, looks at the board and goes, I wouldn't try that. <laughs> and then he walks out, which is like, it was so funny. He's like, you know what? I've tried this. I wouldn't try that. I wouldn't try that if I was you guys, you know? And then he just, and he just walks in. He just makes some kind of offhand comment. And I just thought, man, only a comedian could get away with something like that. Which, and by the way, I have to tell you that uh, Jerry Seinfeld, is has always been so standoffish that I've always found him to be <laughs> one of the most unlikable people in person because he's so standoffish. And, well, uh, uh, you know, I respect him as a comedian, but as a, as a person, uh, he's just not a warm person, you know? Well, it's funny because after the whole thing happened with him and he writes, he's never written an article before in his life, like an yeah. actual article. The only time he's ever written an article, three-fourths of it is just trashing me on a full page of the New York Times. And so then somebody from like E! Entertainment News calls me up and says, um, you know, I'm doing a segment with them. And they say, well, if Jerry Seinfeld was here right now, what would you say to him? And I, I said, well, take the name Seinfeld out of this for a second. If, so, if you wake up one day and you realize that some random person just trashed, eviscerated you for an entire page of the New York Times, are you going to be eager to talk to them? You'll never talk to them. You, you would walk away from the guy. So that's yeah. what I would do. You got to be honest to yourself and ignore the fame part. Yeah. But the flip side is I'm reading his book now, you know, Is This Anything? Where he has every joke he's ever worked on since the 70s. And it's just brilliant. Like he has such an, a unique way of, of looking at the mundane. It's so fascinating. And then if you read mm -hmm. these jokes, like 50 jokes at a time, it kind of gets in your head to start. I feel like my thoughts are sounding like him. Yeah. Yeah. I get that. It's that influence that we were talking about earlier yeah. about how if you spend too much time listening to a particular comedian that you like, they start to rub off on you and you start to, make sounds that they sound, that they make or start uh, physically uh, doing things that they physically do. Yeah. And yeah. Because, to... and, and it's like mu music too. Like if somebody wanted to be sound exactly like you too, or queen or Van Halen, they're going to just suck or come off as like a weak cover band. And I feel like you can't only Anthony Jeselnik that could do Anthony Jesel. only Mitch Hedberg could do Mitch Hedberg. Um, yeah. You know, it, uh, only Jerry Seinfeld. Like if I start suddenly started doing jokes, like what's the deal with supermarkets? Yeah. Uh, people would say, oh, that's Seinfeld. That's a weak Seinfeld. Yeah, there's an amazing story that Rosie O'Donnell 
um, her first time doing stand-up, she signed up for an open mic and did an entire 10-minute Jerry Seinfeld piece and talked like him and said, yeah, what are these people? What are you doing? Yeah, you know, and people were like, what are you doing, man? That's, that's, uh, that's Seinfeld. And she goes, yeah, Jerry Seinfeld, it's awesome. Like, she didn't, <laughs> she didn't understand that you couldn't do that. Like, all the open micers, like, kind of pounced on her after that set. Like, and she, but she did all of Seinfeld's material and did his voice, which is amazing. Let me ask you this, because obviously when you're doing open mics, you're doing it because you want to improve. And people think comedy is just about a sense of humor, making people laugh, but there's sub skills that you learned the first time you went up there. Crowd work, stage presence, having prepared material, likability, mm -hmm. voices, act outs, and so on. And so my daughter was thinking of doing an open mic and... I actually gave her this advice, which is very anti-comedian advice, but I figured it's an open mic. It's going to be three people there. I said, find your favorite jokes from professional comedians and do covers of them. Yeah. <laughs> and I call them covers. like Because this way, at least you know the joke is funny, so this way you could work on the other skills. Yeah. yeah it's, I, it's Honestly, it's not a, a bad piece of advice for somebody who's, who's going on stage for the first time. Um, when you actually get into comedy and start pursuing a, a career, it's, it is considered the yeah. worst thing you can do is to, is to take somebody's material. But like, I remember um, there's a video of me and Jim Brewer and Artie Lang on the internet of, um, of a show that Brewer came up with called comedy covers. And it was just, it was everybody going up and doing their favorite comedians pieces and either doing it at, as that comedian or going a little abstract and saying, well, here's like, I remember one time going up and doing uh, Al Pacino doing George Carlin's football versus baseball. Oh, um, and it was Al Pacino and Al Pacino sounds a lot like George Carlin. So it fit and it worked. And mm -hmm. then one time I did a straight cover of a Sam Kinison piece. Um, and that's the one that's on the internet. Um, with me and Brewer and Artie. And, uh, um, but yeah, we all have our influences and, and who we, um, um, who inspired us to get up there. And then it's just a matter of finding your own voice and figuring out how, whatever it is that makes you funny with your friends, figuring out how to get an audience full of strangers to understand that within a moment or two and get them on the same page. And Mitch, by the way, Mitch used to uh, have really terrible sets because the audience never liked his rhythm. Hmm. And, uh, and he had this thing where he would either completely murder or have an unbelievably awkward set um, because people not, never got into his rhythm. And when, he, when the audience got him in the beginning, he destroyed. And um, in fact, I remember... When I moved in with him in, um, what was that? That was April, I want to say the, the day that I arrived in New York. I want to say it was April 16th, 1998. I left, I, I took a train from Seattle on April 13th, 1998. Arrived at uh, um, Penn Station on April 16th, 1998. Mitch picked me up and then uh, we went to his apartment and then... Um, and then we went out and he did sets that night. And one of them was at Stand Up New York. You're kidding. I remember it's, at Stand Up New York that night, he did a joke that I had heard him do many times. But that night at Stand Up New York, it killed. And Mitch added a line <laughs> that was so stupid. It was, uh, it was a joke he used to do about, uh, I was at a sports bar. And this guy came up to me and said, hey, man. What's the score? I said, man, I don't know. What's the game? <laughs> and, then he, and then he pushed me. So I shoved him back and I ran. And he chased me down the street and he caught me and flipped me around. I looked at him. He was wearing a bandana, a backwards baseball cap, an earring, and a nose ring. He said, man, you got a lot of nerve. And I said, man, you got a lot of cranial accessories <laughs> and on this one set at stand up new york it destroyed and mitch started laughing and he said ha ha see you guys are a smart crowd 
last night I was in front of a stupid crowd. And in front of the stupid crowd, I had to say, man, you got a lot of shit on your head. <laughs> <laughs> and it fucking killed. I, I never heard him use that secondary line ever again. So how do you, how do you think he comes up with a joke like that? It's like almost uh, like a Rubik's Cube to come up with something like, like the whole joke. Yeah, he, I don't know, but I can tell you that uh, when I was living with him, he actually typed on an old school typewriter. He huh. actually had an old school typewriter they liked to type on. And uh, um, man, he was, he was so red hot, man. And uh, I, I, um, I wasn't with him when this happened, but, and he actually was so humble. He would have never told me this story, but one of his friends told me about uh, Mitch got a, a big gig in a big theater back where he, in his hometown in, in Minnesota, opening for Dennis Miller and Mitch leveled the place. And um, um, Dennis Miller walks out and says, uh, oh, it's always good to follow the local town prodigy. Like, you know, it's like he had to make a comment about Mitch destroying the place. Oh, my gosh. And, uh, yeah. Yeah. Mitch. Uh, I'll tell you one quick Mitch story. That day that I moved into his place, I'm, I'm trying to get my bearings straight. And he's 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 pouring a lot of information on me about the apartment, about the keys, about the closest subway, because the next day he's going to leave and go to the, he had a show in the Catskills. Um, he was doing the um, comedy club uh, over the weekend in the Catskills. So I was going to be alone in the apartment by myself. And he's giving me all this information. And then at one point he walked up to his front door and uh, uh, there was a map of the uh, New York city subway on the back of his front door. And he said, Oh, Hey Craig, uh, check this out. This is a map of the New York City subway. And I looked at it, and the first time you look at it is very confusing. There's yeah. yellow and red and blue lines, you know, going all over the place. And I'm looking at the map and Mitch goes, so that's how that works. And then he, <laughs> and I was like, what the fuck? Like, what is that? Like, I didn't like understand it. Like, yeah, yeah. But uh, uh, he, he was one of the most well put together people I've ever met in my life. And I love him and I miss him. And what do you mean by well put together? He was very independent. Uh, he was very uh, kind. He was very selfless. He was very independent uh, mm -hmm. that he could cook. Like he, he could, he was, a, he was, he was able to cook all kinds of different foods. He loved to cook. And he just, um, he was just such a pleasant and thoughtful person to be around. He just had this one flaw and that flaw killed him. Ugh. And when I would go and do shows in Minneapolis over the years, his, his, uh, his parents, um, Arnie and uh, uh, was it Mary, Mary Hedberg would come to see me. And at some point we would get into discussion about, drug addiction and they would say they'd start asking questions like is there anything we could have done mm. and you have this tough thing of like there's really nothing you can do when somebody doesn't want to help themselves and uh you know it's weird like trying to explain to these two wonderfully beautiful people that when i was knee deep in my own addictions there were people in my life who i know i was hurting what i was doing was hurting a lot of people around me and there's this weird thing where I would tell people, I, and I would mean it, I am really sorry that, that I'm making you feel this way. I really am. But it's almost like you have to kind of come to that moment, like, that, like, you, like you said earlier, that moment of clarity, because you're yep. just not going to pay attention to it before then. Yeah, you have to get hurt so bad. That it just, uh, and you know, what's crazy is like, you know, I, those last so many years of my life, I mean, I was there. I was, I knew that I was in pain. I knew what I was doing was not working. I was dating girls who were just as bad as I was. And we would say to each other, like, this is bad. 
like we would actually say to it's kind of a weird thing to say to someone that you are just getting to know and just starting to date. But I was dating women that I would I would say, man, we have a problem. And they'd say, yeah, we do. And I'd say, we need help. And they'd say, yeah, we, we do need help. And we wouldn't stop. We would still keep going. You know, it, it's, yeah, it's really weird. If, well, because in some sense, drugs are great, right? Yeah. They feel mm-hmm. really good. Mm-hmm. And, so, and so things have to be really bad for you to say, okay, I, not only did I realize intellectually they were bad, but now I see and I feel emotionally and inside of me, this, I got to change or I'm, or I'm not going to enjoy life anymore. Well, there's the, it, the drugs feel good in the beginning and then there's a point and you don't know where that line is, where it stops feeling as good and there's a back end to it that feels worse and worse and worse, mm-hmm. but you keep chasing that, that original good experience and it's, it's as old as time. It's, it's the story that gets repeated generation after generation and uh, the one benefit we have is there's all these shows that we see, whether it's intervention or behind the music, where we see the visual evidence of what somebody looks like when they are really, really down in a hole. And those are lessons uh, for the next generation that, um, you know, who still need to sometimes figure it out on their own and go out and get hurt on their own um, to learn that uh, the, that, it's not working anymore. And there are some people who can do it a little bit and, and be okay with it. I wasn't one of those people. It's like I, once I started, it was like, oh man, I, I, and it took me a long time to admit that to myself, but uh, that that's ultimately what it comes down to for anyone who saves their lives is being able to swallow your pride and admit to yourself, you have a problem. And that is the difference between life and death is your fucking ego. Mm -hmm. Being able to just look at yourself and say, this isn't working. I have no control over this. And that's a, that's a difficult fucking line for people to cross. And, but that is that line that will either save your life or not is being able to admit to yourself, you have a problem. And how long have you been sober now? Uh, 15 years and 10 months. It'll be, 16 years on December 14th. Um, And it will also be the 18 year anniversary of my heart attack. Cause I I got sober. I got sober on the two year anniversary of my heart attack. Oh man. Yeah. Yeah. When you were having a heart attack, did you think to yourself, I'm about to die? (laughs) I felt, well, that night of the 13th, you know who I was with? Sean Rouse. I was with Sean Rouse and a comedian, a couple of comedians in the Seattle area. And I had been going for a couple of days. And on the morning of the 14th, I just, uh, I felt my chest kept getting tighter and um, my breathing became more and more difficult. And um, I knocked on the door of my friend, Jason, whose place I was staying at. And I said, uh, I'm having problems breathing. And he took me to the hospital. They started running a bunch of tests. And uh, they started calling for a cardiologist. Um, and I asked the doctor, what, why do we need a cardiologist? And he said, well, your enzyme levels are supposed to be this. And they are 100 times that. And I said, okay, what does that mean? And he said, you're having a heart attack. Hmm. And uh, at that moment, I didn't know if like it sounded like he was telling me you are dying. That, that's what I assumed he meant. So I started calling friends and, um, and uh, apologizing <laughs> to my friends for my behavior that was now looking like it was going to kill me. I started calling a bunch of friends and saying, I'm sorry that I've done this. I'm sorry I did this to you. I don't know if I'm going to survive this, but I want you to know that I love you. And, uh, uh, I actually was holding my friend Jason's hand the whole time while I was calling people and crying and telling them I'm sorry, I'm so I'm sorry for being a fuck up, and uh, um, and that experience uh, I survived it and and how how they respond? How did your friends respond? Um, just uh, 
you know, it's really weird. Um, they all just said, I love you. Um, and you, you know, they try to support me by, you know, and try to say positive thoughts. You're going to be okay. But, um, I was in the hospital for over a week and they actually checked me out of the hospital. I was in Seattle, but living in New York at the time. And when they checked me out of the hospital, um, it was the day that I was flying back to Seattle. So I had about eight hours to my flight and I got out of the hospital and got together with a bunch of friends of mine who gave me this kind of intervention slash pep talk. Like, we're worried about you. We don't ever want to see you go through this again. And I said, believe me, I don't ever want to do this again. I, I trust me. That was a horrifying experience. And we all separated and I got in my car and I had five more hours before my flight left. So I decided to drive into downtown Seattle to just kill a couple hours. And on my way into downtown Seattle, I started thinking about going to the comedy club that I started at, the Comedy Underground. <clears throat> and I thought, uh, God, you know, you know, it'd be great. It's if, oh my God, I need to go to the Comedy Underground and just have a beer, like a nice cold. Oh my God, you know, it'd be really great right now after the week that I had, if I could just have some beer and uh, like a little bit, like obviously not enough to have another heart attack, but just, just like a little bit of Coke. And then all of a sudden for the first time in my life, a voice popped into my head that just said, something is wrong with you. The, something is, is wrong with the way you think. And that was the first time I realized that my own thoughts, my own brain was sending me signals that were counterproductive to having a happy life. And I started um, uh, going into, um, into recovery and trying to understand that. And then I was, I was sober for that whole calendar year of 2003. Um, and on New Year's Eve of 2003, that same ex that I ended up moving in to Eddie Van Halen's house over, um, I called her up. I was going to a Metallica concert on New Year's Eve in Vegas. And I called her up and oh, she, she was mad at me about something. I can't remember what it was about, but I called her up and I said, Hey, I know you're mad at me, but can I, can I just talk to you for a minute about something serious? She said, what do you want? And I said, I'm thinking about getting fucked up tonight. And I just, I want to talk to you about it. And she goes, you know what? fuck you. You're on your own. I don't give a shit. And she hung up on me. And this is not her fault. I made the decision to say, well, I'm going to show her. And I went out and got loaded that night after midnight because I wanted to make sure I made it through an entire calendar year sober. And I got hammered that night. And, uh, and then I just kept falling backwards and free falling for the entire year until December 14th of 2004. And then all of a sudden a light bulb turned on and I just, um, I had half a beer in my hand. I threw it in the garbage. I never had a drink again. Wow. And yeah. you know, and the light bulb was just boom. Good question. It was, uh, it was December 13th. It had just struck midnight. So now it's December 14th. I'm in Hollywood at the Roxy watching this band called Steel Panther. They're this hilarious heavy metal band that is a, uh, a kind of a parody of all the 80s heavy metal bands. And um, they were called um, Metal School back then. And the clock strikes midnight. And I had a plan. Like, I know I need to get sober again. I had a plan to just finish up the year and go hard and then just get sober on January 1st because in my mind, January 1st is just an easy day to remember when people say, hey, when did you get sober? I'll be like, oh, uh, January 1st. Like for some reason, I wanted it to be an easy day to remember. So I, I, I use that as an excuse to just keep getting hammered. Hmm. And my plan was to just barrel through the end of December and get as fucked up as I can and then start over on January 1st but the clock strikes midnight. I'm looking at my phone and I realize I had a heart attack two years ago today. And now here I am, I'm starting to pay my mom's bills. 
I'm, uh, I'm circling around opportunities where I could literally take care of my mom for the rest of her life if any of these opportunities start to work out. And here I am drinking for no other reason than it just feels good and it, and it feels good to my ego. And it's incredibly selfish. Like, I, I just want to feel cool in my brain. So that's why I'm just drinking because it makes me feel cool. And, um, and it was just this massive moment of clarity. And I had never thrown a beer out. I never had thrown a, a bottle out with beer still in it. And I had half a, a beer in my hand and I was a little buzzed. And I, it was just this unbelievable moment of clarity that um, I'm being very selfish. I, I can be a great asset to my mom. I can really help my mom. And here I am uh, just trying to feel cool. And, and it just, it was so crystal clear. And I threw that bottle out and I never drank again, never drank or did drugs or, or anything again. And um, I, I, I am the kind of person that Coke was my problem, but I can't do anything else because it will lead back to Coke. So I didn't really, I'm not an alcoholic. But if I drink, I will end up doing coke. So if you're going to get away from a drug, you have to get away from all drugs. So let, let, let me ask this, is, and this is a, a weird sort of question. Since you got sober, what have you lost as a result of doing that? Like, did you feel, oh, I'm not going to be as funny or I'm going to be more nervous on stage or I'm going to be more inhibited? Well, I learned some things along the way, and that, that's the same thing that happens to all musicians, all comedians, uh, actors. You have a fear that somehow this thing helped you along. And that is just as false as the idea that you look and sound cool when you're drunk. Mm -hmm. And I, I am so thankful that I had a friend say this to me. But one night I was in Tacoma and doing a set in front of a really rowdy crowd. And I couldn't fucking control them. They were so out of hand and I couldn't get them to listen to me. I walked off stage and that friend, Jason, who his name's Jason Stewart. He's a comedian from the, the Seattle area. Um, he, when I got off stage, I said, I, I, I know this is going to be not a, a smart thing to say, but if I had some drinks tonight, that would have gone a lot better. And my friend said, what are you talking about? I said, well, when I drink, I'm just, I'm fucking cool. You know, like I'm super cool when I drink and I just, and when the crowd's rowdy, I'm rowdy with them. And I, I kind of run the party, you know? And Jason said, dude, you're awful on stage when you drink. And I was like, not when I drink. And he goes, yeah, you ramble a lot when you're, when you drink, you ramble, you never get to the punchlines. You fucking add all these extra words. And, and I, it never dawned on me. Like I, I, when he said it, I could see what he was saying. And I was like, holy shit, thank God. I had a friend who was able to cancel out this weird ego that I had in my head about something that was a lie that, that I told myself because it just kind of feels cool when you're drunk and you're on stage. You feel like you're super cool and you never are. You never are that cool. That's, that's, that's the best possible thing anyone could have said to you. Yeah, and uh, you you wonder if you're ever going to be able to date again, because everything about uh, meeting up with uh, with a girl had had to do with alcohol um, and getting drunk, and yeah, you you wonder all these things like, am I going to be able to do this again? And and all those things happen. It's like you just have to. You've been living at sea for so long, you just have to figure out how to live back on land again, and it, it just takes time, and uh, and eventually you figure it out. But yeah, the, there. There's all these dumb, selfish fears that you have about, but how am I going to do that again? How am I going to do this again? And if you're lucky, you won't get fucked up anymore while you try to learn how to live without getting fucked up. And so like 15 years later now, where are you at? What are you uh, up to? Uh, well, 15 years later now, it's uh, being there for people who are looking for the same kind of answers and being available for people who need help like people were for me. It keeps me fresh in terms of knowing that I have to stay on the same path and uh, while helping somebody find their answers and constantly staying. I mean, 
um, when you said, what did you lose when you got clean? I just remember my first thought was like, well, I lost a bunch of friends that I got rid of. I just realized there are people in my life that are like, I just had to like, just clear out because their only role in my life was getting fucked up with me. And I was lucky that there were people in my life who did not like that side of me and were not partiers at all that uh, I was able to hang on to in my life. And so I still had friends that didn't give a shit about any of that stuff. So, um, And my guess is ultimately you became accessible to a wider group of friends, right? Because most yes. people don't want to be around alcoholics or yeah. addicts. Yeah, and you don't realize at the time uh, when you start going back to the clubs that you were at and the places you used to hang out at and you watch people drinking, nobody was drinking as much as you were. And you're like, well, I thought everybody was getting shit faced like I was. And they're not. I was, I, in my mind, I thought everybody was doing the same thing I was doing. Another thing that happened that was really weird is uh, over time, people stopped sending shots to the stage. I clearly was giving off a vibe that I'm not the kind of guy who gets shots on stage. And that, that bothered me for a while. I mean, every once in a while, like I was in Vegas a couple months ago and somebody on the strip kind of whispered to me and said, you want some Coke? And I was like, still got it. Like, yeah, that's fucking, I still got it. Like, I'm, like uh, the answer is no, but maybe, I don't know. I don't look like a guy who's a, uh, who's a square. Like, I might want cocaine someday. Don't, don't not try to sell it to me. I'm, I'm still cool enough that you should offer it, you know? And uh, so that, that was kind of funny what they did to my ego that, uh, that the guy offered me cocaine, but. Um, <laughs> you know, it all reminds me actually of what we were saying about uh, Jim Norton and his route to authenticity. I think many people become addicted now is the wrong word after this conversation, but uh, uh, addicted to the, lies that define their identity. Oh, oh absolutely. I'm an employee that has to please the boss or I'm a, a husband that has to, you know, make sure my wife and kids think I'm, you know, the best provider in the world. And so there's all this added stress that these lies place on you, which could destroy your life as opposed to being authentic. And that's huge weight is off uh, where you could be, you could finally be yourself when that, when that, huge weight of lying is, is that everybody else does is taken off of your chest. Oh man. When you first, uh, get out from underneath that and admit to yourself that you have a flaw and own it. Oh my God. It, it is so freeing to say, yes, I have a problem and I know that I have a problem and I need help. It is, it is so freeing to the rest of your happiness to be able to admit that and own it. And in the beginning, you don't, admit it and own it to very many people. I pretty much just admitted it to myself. Um, and over time I became a little more comfortable telling more people and more people. And then now I'm at a point where I realized that I was uh, hindered by what you thought of me. And I wanted you to think I was cool. And I, I wanted you to think that I was available to, to have a drink and, and to get drunk with you. And I didn't, you know, for, because of whatever connotation I had in my head of people who don't drink. And um, I didn't want you to think I was one of those guys. But then you start to realize that kind of fear of what people think of you kills people. It, it, yeah. it leads to your death because I care more about what you think about me than I do my own health. I'm, I'm partying to the point where I'm killing myself but I want you to think I'm okay and cool. So I'm going to keep doing it because I, I worry about what you think of me. And if I got sober, you might not think I'm as cool, but it's, you know, it's crazy. It's an insanity. I, I, I feel bad, but I, I have to head out here in a couple of minutes. Oh um, yeah. No problem. Craig, look, this was, this was so enjoyable, you know, come on anytime or let's t let's touch base again soon. And, and, um, and therapeutic. This turned into a very <laughs> therapeutic. I think it started out wanting that one subject of what, what's been going on in the news. And then it turned into like this whole therapy session. So you did a great job of, uh, of asking incredibly 
insightful questions that brought out stuff out of me that I haven't really examined much. Well, well, I, I really appreciate it. And again, I really appreciate you, you coming on and I know a lot of things are going on and um, I appreciate it. And look, when I master my Seinfeld impression, you're the first person I'll call to see if I'm doing it right. So. All right. Perfect. Yeah. And we'll just, we'll call this episode, the fuck happened to Craig? Cause it was like <laughs> so much that I just poured on you and so much that I vented to you about, but, uh, but man, you really did ask questions that really probed in the exact space that I, I needed uh, for you to go for me to say what I had to say. So. No, I appreciate it. And, and I, again, I appreciate you coming on and, and have fun. And uh, look, let's talk soon. If we're in forever in the same city, let's hang out. All right. You got it. And hopefully I will be back there uh, soon. Oh, wait, you're in Florida, right? Yeah. Hopefully I'll be back there soon as well. <laughs> yeah. Let's hope so. All right, let's all, let's all say a, a big prayer for that. Thank you. I'll see you, James. Thanks, Greg. Talk to you soon. So you're saying with Hilton Honors, I can use points for a free night stay anywhere? Anywhere. What about fancy places like the Canopy in Paris? Yeah, Hilton Honors, baby. Or relaxing sanctuaries like the Conrad in Tulum? Hilton Honors, baby. Ooh, what about the five-star Waldorf Astoria in the Maldives? Are you going to do this for all 7,000 hotels and resorts? When you want points that can take you anywhere, it matters where you stay. Hilton for the stay. Click the banner to join Hilton Honors for free today.